to everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm Francesca Estragues. I'm an applications engineer at MPS, and I work for the automotive product line. And today I will be presenting this webinar about layout optimization of half bridge topologies. This can apply for automotive applications, but also for industrial consumer and really any application where you have a DC DC converter. So please uh, join us. First, we will start with a brief introduction. So half bridges are the most basic form of switching converters for DC-DC, and they are the bread and butter of MPS. MPS does a wide variety of different uh, converters, uh, also many different topologies for DC-DC, AC-DC, DC to AC, and whatnot. But the Really, the core of the company is based on DC DC converters based on a half bridge topology. So, first, I will cover what do we understand for a half bridge at MPS, because this might differ uh, depending on where you are reading this. And then I will present which are the most common half bridge topologies in DC DC converters and how to analyze them. So, we will focus on how to identify the critical current paths in these topologies and how to minimize their electromagnetic interference, or EMI, from now on. At the end, I will show a bunch of empirical results of radiated emissions testing based on different input routing styles for the back converter. Uh, it's a kind of a bonus material. And we will uh, see later why focusing on uh, the input voltage routing style of the back can be important for a DC-DC converter. So let's start now. Here we have a half bridge, not to be confused with the H bridge, which is the, the another name for the, the big brother topology, which is the, the full bridge with forfeits. Here we have a very basic um, DC to uh, AC converter, right? So we have a power supply here on the left that can supply a voltage. Uh, we will call it a V in or supply voltage from now on. And then we got a pair of switches. In this case, they are represented uh, with MOSFETs. We got Q1 and Q2. And by applying a PWM to the control of these switches, we can modulate the voltage that we will see on our load. In this case, we can modulate the average voltage at this load. So we have two different uh, periods in this uh, PWM modulation. We got the uh, off time, and we always talk uh, in reference to our uh, high side FED, uh, in this case for the half bridge. Um, so in the T off, our Q1 MOSFET is open, so it's not conducting, and our Q2 MOSFET will be conducting. So across our load, we will have zero volts, right? We got a direct short between our positive terminal of the load and our negative terminal of the load through Q2, right? And they are all connected to the reference of our power supply, which we can also typically call ground. And then we got the other half of the period, which we call uh, T on or on time. And here is where we turn on Q1 and we turn off Q2. So then the voltage across our load will equal to our supply voltage. So we can see it here uh, through being on the, on the right with our waveform. And by modulating the duty cycle of Q1 during this period, we can modulate the average voltage through our load. We can see it now here in red. Uh, in this case, we got a duty cycle of about 50%, which means that Q1 and Q2 will each turn on 50% of the time over a switching period. And this will roughly give uh, an output voltage that is half of our supply voltage. And you can usually calculate the, the average voltage on the load using this formula. So the T on divided by the sum of T on and T off and multiply this by our supply voltage. As you can see, uh, our output voltage, or our average voltage is half of pin but the voltage across the load is changing all the time between zero and the supply voltage. This is creating a rectangular supply for our load. 
usually most loads uh, cannot support uh, such rapidly changing input voltage. And to start with, uh, we have a DC-DC converter between our power supply and our load to, lo uh, to change this voltage, right? We assume that the load is not, uh, is not suitable to operate directly from our supply voltage. So what can we do to smoothen this voltage and instead of getting this rectangular shape, get a flatter profile that our load can work with? We can make a back converter, which is the most common uh, topology seen in DCC converters. A back converter is a converter that converts a supply voltage that is higher than the load voltage by uh, using a half bridge topology and adding a low pass filter between our switching node and our load. So before we had here a rectangular waveform, right? That is not suitable for our load. Now we add a low pass filter and we get a flatter uh, voltage on our load. So we can move from calling this a half bridge to calling this a back converter. Let's now analyze our waveforms. So on our switch node, which is the center point of Q1 and Q2, we can still see here on the right in blue, the rectangular waveform going from zero during our T off to the supply voltage during our T on. We can then look at the wave at the current waveform through our inductor. The inductor opposes to rapid change of current. So instead of seeing a rectangular shape on the inductor, which rapidly changes, we will see a smoother triangular waveform. It will have a downwards constant downward slope during our T off and a constant upward slope during our T on. And you can also see that the current is continuous, right? You can follow it with your pointer continuously uh, without needing to jump. So this current doesn't contain any high frequency content to it. This is uh, very low, very low frequency. It basically contains, if you do the FFT of this waveform, you will see the fundamental switching frequency to it and uh, only a couple of harmonics. Then we get to the discontinuous area, and this is where things can get a bit more interesting uh, for our electromagnetic emissions. We will learn why in a minute. So let's look now at the current waveform through our Q1, our first MOSFET. During our T off, our Q1 will not be conducting, so our current through Q1 is zero, right? And during our T on, Q1 will be conducting, and its current flowing through it will track the current on the inductor, right? Because it's uh, providing the, it's allowing the conduction from our supply to the inductor. So it's following the inductor current. So what does happen when we turn on this uh, Q1? We get a very rapid increase of current from zero to the level at which the inductor is uh, inductor current is sitting at that moment. So we have a very rapid change of current over a very short time, uh, almost uh, maybe usually a few nanoseconds or even lower than that. And the same happens when we turn Q1 off. The current goes from a high level to zero almost immediately. When we look at Q2, we can see pretty much the same waveform, but it's now tracking the, on, the inductor on the downward slope. So our current again is going from zero during our T on, where Q2 is uh, open, to almost instantly rising to a level uh, higher than that when we turn Q2 off on and it's conducting. So again, we have a very rapid change of current over a very short duration of time. And lastly, we can look at the voltage across our load, which is now flat between V in and zero, uh, depending on the duty cycle that we apply to our control. If you actually zoomed in, in this uh, output, volt, output voltage waveform with a very small voltage um, voltage scale, you would see some switching ripple on this waveform. So this is not a flat line. Usually there is some ripple created by our switching that is smoothed out by our C1. I've been putting a lot of emphasis on rapidly changing signals so far. So we have on the switch node, a very rapidly changing voltage 
when we turn on and off uh, Q1 in these edges here and here. And we have on the switch current a very rapidly changing current over time when we turn on Q1 and uh, turn it off and when we turn on Q2 and we turn it off. And why do we need to pay attention to rapidly changing voltages and currents? It's because they generate electric fields in the case of voltages and magnetic fields in the case of currents. So this is the source of our electromagnetic interference when working with half bridge converters. Just as a reminder uh, from your university lectures, an AC current flowing through a conductor will create a magnetic dipole antenna. And this uh, is the same case for an electric uh, dipole. Any AC voltage in a conductor will create an antenna. The radiation of this antenna increases with the area of the antenna and with the current, especially AC current magnitude flowing through this antenna. In our converters, the magnitude of current is usually given by the application, right? It's not easy to just reduce the amount of power that we are delivering with our TCDC converter. So we only have, if we want to reduce the radiation of our converter, we only have one degree of freedom, which is to reduce the area of this antenna. And now we will start locating these antennas in our circuit and see how we can reduce them to minimize our emissions. Let's start with the back converter. As, a, as I mentioned before, this is the most uh, common type of TCDC converter. And I'm sure that pretty much everyone here will be, we, has seen a back converter in their designs or uh, is studying it right now. So we look at the schematic now. We got our supply voltage here, V in, but we have added a capacitor here, the input capacitor in this case. And then we got our half bridge, Q1 and Q2, our center point, which is the switch bolt, uh, switch node, our, and then we had our output filter, the inductor, C out, and our load. We learned that is, there is this continuous current in Q1 and Q2. So if we want to find where we will have very rapidly changing currents, can anyone guess which uh, current loop? we can uh, locate here. I'll give you a couple of seconds. We can see that there is a very fast current loop between Q1, Q2, and the input capacitor. So the power supply is in the ideal world has no impedance right to our circuit, but in real world, there is a cable that is uh, some inductance, some resistance in this cable that makes it not suitable to supply high frequency current. So we usually add these input capacitors in our back converters and they will do the heavy lifting when carrying high frequency currents. If we look at the currents in the circuit, we have two different times. Uh, during T on here in the right in red, we have current flowing from the input capacitor to our Q1 and it is providing this very rapid increase of current. And then we got the current flowing through Q1 and through the inductor with an upward slope. Then in Q2, sorry, in, uh, in off time, our Q1 will turn off and our Q2 will turn on. And then we will have inductor flowing through the inductor, sorry, current flowing through the inductor in a downward slope and our input capacitance uh, will this time provide the very rapidly changing current for Q2. So the current through the inductor is continuous. So we don't really need to worry too much about the magnetic fields emitted by the inductor, but we have to worry about the magnetic fields emitted by our input capacitor. And this is something that the first time you listen to this, it completely contradicts what you learned at university, right? But if you think about this, it's really clear right now. We got very rapidly changing currents through this capacitor. We got slow changing currents through this inductor. So let's now try to locate this in the real world, right? Looking at schematics is nice, but 
looking at the real implementation is always better. We have here a discrete back converter. So we can clearly see our MOSFETs, Q1 and Q2, all our components, the input capacitor here connecting a power plane on the left, a copper power plane connected to the drain of Q1 and our input capacitors. And then we have here on the bottom our reference voltage or ground. This is connected to the source of our Q2. And on the right, we have our output voltage plane, which is connected to the output capacitors. So let's locate our fast changing current loop in this uh, design. It's here, right, between our input capacitors, our Q1, and our Q2, just as we learned on the schematic side. By placing the input capacitor uh, very tightly with Q1 and Q2, we can minimize the area of this current loop. We cannot change the amplitude of the current, but we can, as we explained, we can change the area of this current loop. So we want to make this as small as possible. We have then other capacitors, not only the first one. So each of them will have a slightly larger uh, current loop, but still, this is a very good approach to minimize the emissions of our converter. We can then try to locate where the rapidly changing voltage is here. So it's in the center point of Q1 and Q2. So it's this polygon here that you can see that it's connecting the source of Q1 with the drain of Q2 and our inductor. And you can see that we are making this as small as possible while still allowing the placement of our components and allowing sufficient spacing between them. So the rule when uh, routing your switch node is to make it as small as possible to minimize the uh, radiated emissions while still allowing proper current flow and the placement of your components. Let's now look at the boost converter. So if you look at the boost converter, we again have our input voltage here, voltage supply, our input capacitor, and then the boost topology changes from the back. We got an inductor on the input side, and then we have our half reach. This time Q1 is our low side fed, and our Q2 uh, in this case is the synchronous rectifier. This can be also a diode in non-synchronous application, but we are looking now at the synchronous back boost converter. And then we have our output capacitor to smoothen the voltage at the load and our load. This is different from the back, but if we actually put them side by side, you would see that they are actually pretty much the same. We just mirror it. What used to be our um, input voltage is now our load. And what used to be our output voltage is now our supply voltage. So you, if you think about this, it's very easy to analyze a boost converter. It's just a reverse back. So can anyone guess where the high frequency currents are going to flow in the boost converter? It's going to be between our half bridge, as usual, because it has this continuous current, and our output capacitor in this, in this case. The output capacitor is directly connected between our half reach, so this will be supplying all the discontinuous current to the FEDs. Instead, the input capacitor, in this case, has an inductor in between Q1, so there is no way this input capacitor will carry high frequency currents. This is here just to decouple the input of our boost converter from our power supply, which might be located far away. Now let's look at the real uh, or the physical implementation of the boost converter. We have the layout of the back. And since we know that the boost is just a reversed back, we can flip it. And we now have a boost converter. So on the left, again, we have the input voltage plane. With our input capacitors, we got our inductor. And then we have our half bridge, Q1, Q2, the output capacitance. And on the right, we got our output voltage. So locating the high uh, frequency current loop is very easy now that we know how to locate it on the back, right? It's the same principle. Look for your half bridge and look for a capacitor that is connecting uh, across it. So in this case, the, the coupling capacitor for the bus converter is the output capacitance. 
Okay, the bug and the boost are really easy. Let's now increase the difficulty of this a little bit. I don't want you to get bored. So can anyone here guess what this converter is? I'll give you five seconds to think about it. But notice that we still have a half bridge topology between Q1, Q2. We got an inductor in between, and we have our input capacitor and an, our output capacitor. But this is a bit strange, right? Our input capacitor is connected across our power supply. This we know. Our output capacitor is connected across our load. This is also familiar. But now the positive terminal of the load is actually on our ground point. So what is this converter? This is an inverting backpost converter. This is a, basically a back converter that can create a negative voltage in respect to its uh, input supply. And this voltage will be floating below ground, right? It will, it will make its reference float below ground to generate a negative voltage. And then you can connect the load with a positive terminal on ground, zero volts, and the negative terminal to a negative voltage in respect to ground. This is very useful, uh, for example, in lighting applications. When you are using LEDs, you care about the direction of the current through the LED to make it shine. But you actually don't care if the voltage in the cathode or anode are negative in respect to ground, right? You just care about the current. So a very easy way to make a converter that can supply a voltage that is above or below in magnitude to the supply voltage is making an inverting back post. You only need the same components as you would need for a back converter. Can anyone guess where the high frequency current loop is here? Because we have this inductor here in between that makes it a bit hard to spot. The high frequency current loop is between our Q1 and Q2, the half bridge, and the series connection of the output capacitance and the input capacitance. So for an inverting back post, both the capacitor across the into ground and from ground to our minus output voltage is, are, are both carrying high frequency currents. So they are both really important to decoupling our uh, inverting back post converter. Knowing this, we can rearrange it into a more palatable way. This now looks much more similar to a back converter, right? We just moved the supply voltage here on the top right corner, but we now have an input capacitor across Q1 and Q2. And this is just a consolidated series connection of our old input and output capacitor. We have just placed now a decoupling capacitor between our positive terminal of the supply and the negative terminal of the load. And this will carry the high frequency current of this, uh, back, uh, of this DC DC converter. And then we have our low pass filter to smoothen out the voltage. And our load is now connected between zero volts and a negative voltage. Here we have the rapidly changing current loop. And in switch, we got the rapidly changing voltage. So now let's look at the physical implementation. And you will see that I'm really lazy. I'm drawing everything the same way, but really all DCD converter, DCDC converters based on a half bridge are the same thing. It's just a matter of rearranging the, the nets. So in this case, I have the input voltage here on the right with a plane, same as before. But what used to be my ground reference is now my floating negative voltage in respect to ground. And what used to be my output voltage is now ground. So if I connect an LED between ground and minus V out, it will conduct and shine light. And again, the high frequency current loop is the same one as for the back and for the boost. It's between Q1, Q2, and the input capacitor. So to finish with the topologies, let's go to a four switch back post. So if you need an output voltage that can be either higher or lower than your supply voltage, and you actually want it to be positive, so you are not supplying LEDs anymore, but you are supplying actually a device that needs positive voltage across, uh, from ground, then you will need <clears throat> four switches when implementing a back post topology. We have now 
two loops. We got our input loop on the left between C1 and our um, backside half bridge, Q1 and Q2. And now we have another loop between our second half bridge on the boost side between Q4, Q3, and the output capacitor. So this is basically having a back and a boost on the same circuit. So when you are laying this out on a board, you just need to be paying attention to two separate current loops on the PCB. But it's really the same principle as a back and a boost. You've seen that it's always the same thing, right? We are always locating a capacitor that's carrying high frequency current between our half bridge. And this is the same across all converters. So once you get really familiar with a half bridge, you can always identify the high frequency current loops that you need to pay attention to when doing layout. And it's the same with the high frequency voltage uh, nodes. So the switch node, in this case for the four switch back push, we got two of them. We've got the center point between Q1 and Q2, which is this polygon that you can imagine under the inductor, Q1, Q1 and Q2. And then we got the switch two with Q3 and Q4 here on the right. And it's the same principle. You want to keep them as small as possible while still allowing the necessary current to flow through it. There are tools online that you can use to calculate the width of your polygon according to your current and the thickness of your copper. OK, so we've been focusing a lot on discrete implementation of dc dc converters, right, where you can see your Q1 and Q2. But actually, uh, at MPS, we specialize in integrated converters. It's in the name, right, monolithic power systems. So let's now look at what we can do with an integrated back converter. Here on the right, we got the layout of a dc dc converter from us. This is a automotive uh, 40 volt converter. Uh, it can do up to six amps on the output, but this is not important right now. We just want to look at the layout. It's difficult, right, to locate Q1 and Q2 here. We only have a black box usually here with some pins connected to it, but it's difficult to know where the MOSFETs are inside. But usually a very easy way to locate them or to approximate where they are sitting is to find your input uh, voltage pin, pins, your power ground pins, and your switch pins. This is all given by us, right? We make a part that integrates the MOSFET, so you cannot modify the displacement in order to minimize the current loop. But you still have a degree of freedom to minimize this current loop, which is the placement of your input capacitors, in this case, for the back converter. So you want to place the input capacitors as close as possible to your DC-DC converter in order to minimize this current loop. You can see here that actually we have a small capacitor. This package is uh, 0603 to fit within the, the pitch of our DC-DC converter. And this really minimizes the loop size for the high frequency current. Most of the high frequency current will be carried by these small capacitors. And then we have a pair of larger capacitors on the output that will carry lower frequency uh, current and will be used to decouple these from the input harness. And then the other degree of freedom that you have to minimize emissions is in the electric field department, which is to keep the switch node as small as possible. And this is where the integrated converters really shine red because our MOSFETs are so small and they are tightly integrated in the converter, your switch node really doesn't need to be too large to connect it to the inductor. You saw before that our MOSFETs were gigant gigantic, right? So the switch node was of a moderate size, but when using an integrated converter, the switch node can be really tiny. You just need to have it as wide uh, as needed to conduct the current. In this case, this is a six amps output converter. So we have here about a bit more than a millimeter of thickness on this polygon, but nothing more. You might be wondering why we have two pairs of input pins and output pins on our converter. And this is a very commonly used technique in the industry since a few years now. When you have two capacitors 
that are supplying current to your half bridge and they are placed in a symmetrical way, as can be seen here on the drawing. We got our input connection to the device. This is very simple, but uh, bear with me. We got our input connection to our DC-DC converter. This is our half bridge. We have one capacitor from uh, going down, connected to ground. The current, if we follow the right-hand loop, the right-hand rule, uh, we can uh, we can know that the magnetic field is flowing into the PCB at this in this example. And then on the other side, we got a capacitor that is going up, connected to ground. And if you apply the same rule, you will see that the magnetic fields are going out of the PCB. So they have opposing dimension, uh, opposing directions, and they are very close lo closely located in the circuit. So part of this magnetic field will be canceled by each other. We can do so uh, with some older, like uh, in some older devices from us. This is the MPQ4430, which is a device released in 2017. This part has a single input pin here at the center. And then you can see that we got two pairs of input capacitors connecting to ground on each side. And the direction of their current loops is opposite. So they will cancel each other out. And then on the right, we got the implementation that is being used on most modern back converters. This is the MPQ4323, which is a device released in 2022 which has two pairs of input and output pins on each side of the package. And this not only helps cancel out the magnetic fields, but by having two pins on each side, our preceding inductance from our capacitor to the pin will be much smaller, right? Because it's two inductances in parallel. So they get smaller than if you only had one. Okay, it looks like using integrated back converters is much better, right? You don't need to think about the placement of your MOSFETs. Your size is much smaller, so your electric field emissions are much smaller. But there are also some challenges when using these converters. And I say challenge and not issue because it's a, it can, it's a positive thing and it can be a negative thing. The positive thing is that having such small sizes on our circuit means that we can switch our MOSFETs really fast. If you remember the loss equation for a back converter, for example, you will know that there is a DC loss when conducting through the high side and the low side FET. This is fixed by the, the resistance of our MOSFETs and the current running through them, right? But there is also a switching loss component to this back converter. And the switching loss is directly proportional to the time it takes for our device to have its switch node go from low to high and from high to low. The faster we do this, the lower our losses will be. So by having a small dimension MOSFET inside and by having the driver very tightly connected in our package, we can get super fast rise and fall times, which will be great for efficiency. You can see on this part, the rise time is 577 picoseconds. If you compare this to a controller with external FEDs, you might know that the rise time and fall times of the best discrete uh, MOSFETs are on the nanosecond level, between uh, two nanoseconds and 20 nanoseconds, or even more for higher voltage device. And our fall time is also 900 picoseconds, which is very, very fast. This is, as I said, amazing for efficiency. But when looking at the ringing frequency of our circuit, you will see that it is also pretty high, right? A very rapidly changing voltage and a rapidly changing current through these MOSFETs will stimulate a resonance circuit uh, with our input capacitor and its parasitic inductance, which will oscillate and create this ringing at the switch node. And this ringing at the switch node, when your high side is conducting, will be visible at your input voltage. So if you have a cable connected to your input voltage, this cable will see this very high frequency oscillation and radiate just like an antenna. So using integrated 
the CDC converters is great for efficiency. It's great for solution size. It's great to simplify your circuit design. But this, all these uh, good sites will require you to do a very good layout with this converter. So now that we got the basics, I will present an empirical investigation with it on the effect of routing the input voltage in different ways on the PCB uh, in, in regards to its radiated emissions. So we now know that our input voltage will see any ringing that uh, the switch node has. So it's it can be quite important to route it in a manner that minimizes its uh, electromagnetic emissions. We're now going to look at integrated converters, right? Forget about the discrete devices. Let's do a quick overview of this PCB. We have here on the left, our connector, we call it the EMI because we are doing an EMI test and a ground, right? We got now a low pass filter formed by L2, CN3 and CN4. This is to filter all this noise that we were just talking about from going to the cable. And then on the right side of our PCB, we got our DC-DC converter. It's here on the middle. You can see we are using an integrated back converter. It has its input capacitors on each side. This is one of these nice devices that has the symmetric input voltage. And then we got our inductor here on the right. You just need to imagine it. This is a, the, the Altium layout. And our output capacitors, and then to the right, we got our output voltage connectors. And when doing the EMI test, we connected the load to these terminals. So the first experiment with it is, OK, we know that there is a high frequency voltage signal in our input trace. And this is going to the input car harness, and it will radiate. And we have a low pass filter in L2, C in 3, and C in 4, which is good to filter low frequency. But for high frequency, it's actually not the best. These uh, inductors have a parasitic capacitance across them, so they are not the best for uh, filtering high frequency signals. So we're thinking, can we make a second order filter by tuning the shape of our input supply, which is what you can see below. Instead of having a direct connection from our dc -DC converter to our filter, we have now made this zigzag shape which roughly tripled the distance, which means that we roughly tripled the inductance of this trace. And we also increased the capacitance this trace has to ground. It's very important to know that this trace is placed in the internal layer of a PCB. This is a four layer PCB. So we got a ground plane in layer two, and this is routed in layer three. This uh, metal plate, which is in has a certain dielectric in between them, the, the core of the PCB. And then on the other side, it has a ground plane. So this is really a low value capacitor, right? So let's see if the routing of in made any difference here. In yellow, we got the PCB where the input voltage is uh, routed in a straight line. And in red, we got the results of radiated emissions with a PCB that does a zigzag shape. This is the radiated emissions at very high frequency, so measured with a logarithmic antenna between 180 megas to 1 giga. You can see that the consistently across the full range, the emissions are lower for the PCB that has this zigzag routing on VIN. So this confirms that we effectively made a second order filter for high frequency by using our PCB. This teaches us that um, you can save some cost by using the layout in your advantage. If you understand the parasitics that are created by your layout, you actually don't need to place a second order filter or a ferrite bit. You can use the input trace or the output trace for other topologies to filter this high frequency noise. The next experiment with it is shortening the input trace to the filter, right? We have now the filter very close to our input harness. And uh, on the PCB on the bottom, our input filter is now much closer to the noise source. 
the noise source is the DC DC converter, we are now going to filter its emissions much closer to the source. And then we will have a longer clean trace going to the connector. In this case, we have a long noisy trace that is filtered here, and then there is a short connection to the to the connector. If we look at the EMI again, on yellow, we got the original board, same as before. And in red, we got the, the radiated emissions for the board that has a shorter distance between the DC-DC converter and the filter. Again, you can see that consistently the emissions are lower. And this shouldn't really be the case, right? We have reduced the length of our trace. So we made our parasitic inductance sm uh, smaller. And we also made our parasitic capacitance of this input trace smaller uh, going to the filter. So our second order, order filter that we were think, uh, talking about before is now worse at filtering. But instead, we got better results. And this is something that can be a bit uh, hard to understand. But our theory is that even if our input trace is contained in the internal layers, the shape it has will affect on how the high frequency resonates through it and will affect on how it radiates when it reaches the input harness. It also, by filtering it closer to the emission sources, we minimize the paths uh, by how these high frequency currents can couple to other traces in the board and end up coupling into our, into our input cable, which is the one that ends up radiating uh, to, the, to the antenna. So what we learned with this is it's good to filter the emissions at the source, right? Not only at the connector, but close to the DC-DC converter. I would also not place the input filter too close to the DC-DC converter so that the inductors are close together, because then some of this noise can couple from the switching inductor to the filter inductor. So you want to have at least a couple of centimeters of distance between them, but it's better to filter the noise at the source. We see many times in uh, the PCBs of our customers that the mechanical design is really constraining, so you don't have a lot of space to separate the input and uh, switching inductors for your filter. And this ends up uh, resulting in that the input filter is bypassed, and we see a very high radiation on the input harness. So sometimes it's better to talk to your mechanical team beforehand and make sure that you have enough distance between the source of emissions, in this case, the dc converter, and your input harness and your filter. The next test that I'm going to show is comparing a board that has the input filter close to the source and the, the input voltage routed in the internal layer, like we just uh, tested before. But now we will test the effect that, ha that routing the, the input voltage in the internal layer has. So for the board in the bottom, we routed it in the top layer. This is now visible. If you look at the PCB, you can now see the input trace. So if there is any AC voltage on this input trace, this will uh, emit electric fields. Everything else stayed the same. So let's see the impact of this, uh, of burying, burying the input voltage in the PCB. In red, we got the results of the, the original board that has the input voltage inside the, the PCB on the internal layer three. And in purple, we got the emissions of the board that exposed in on the top layer. And you can again see that consistently, the board that exposes in has higher emissions, especially at this high frequency here, 800 megahertz, which suspiciously overlaps with the ringing that we were seeing on that wave for below before. So we can see that V in carries the ringing of the switch node, and it is radiating it now through electric coupling to the environment. So you want to keep, even if V in is usually treated as a quiet node, like ground, you actually now know that V in is rather noisy, and you want to minimize the area that uh, it has on the external layers of the PCB. So you want to filter being close to the source, and you also don't want to have it 
sitting on a big polygon on your PCB. This is not good news for the thermal management team, as this as the input voltage is usually a good way of having a big plane is usually a good way of dissipating heat, but there is always the drawback of higher electromagnetic emissions. And finally, I have here a very quick test with it. So we focused a lot on the way we route the input voltage on this board, and we were not doing anything on our output voltage. And when we did the analysis of the back converter, we saw that there is no high frequency current going on the output. So we shouldn't really worry too much about it, right? We got the low pass filter of our inductor and our output capacitors. We shouldn't see any high frequency current on the output. So we did the test. We have on the top, the original board we were looking at, the one that has the input filter close to the converter and the input trays buried in the internal layers. And on the bottom, we have the same board, but now we added a small output capacitor very close to the connector to filter high frequency uh, signals. This is around a 10 nanofarad capacitor in a 0603 size. So let's see what this tiny capacitor is making to our radiated emissions. Again, in red, we have the original waveform. And then in green, we got the emissions of our board where we added the high frequency filter on the load. You can see that for the low frequency, this is not doing anything. We have an overlap of the emissions of both uh, boards, but whoops, above about uh, 500 megahertz, we start to see a huge difference. Actually a bigger difference than anything we did before. So why is that? Our output voltage is supposed to be quiet on a back converter. So how can the, the output voltage be radiating so much into the environment to the point where this capacitor was all we needed in order to remove all these resonances at, at the high frequency end. So let's look at the methodology of this test and at the setup. We got here on the left, the picture of our board. This is not exactly the board we were testing, but it's one of the same batch. We got our input cable here on the left. And this is following the CISPR 25 standard. So we got a meter long cable connecting between these and our listen. We have our low pass filter here at the input. Here we got our DC DC converter circuit. And then on the output, we are using a load resistor. We are using a big metal resistor so that it can dissipate the heat generated by the power of this back converter. And this load is connected to our board through some short cables. We again were trying to minimize the, the loop, but still this is a loop, right? And this is a very big metal structure that will radiate any AC voltage that is running through it. So how did the AC voltage get to the output if our output is quiet? We now need to look at the inductor that we are using for our low pass filter of the back converter. When we break down the inductor, we can see the construction method is a flat wire. Flat wire inductors are great because they have a very thick conductor. So the DCR of the inductor is much lower than in other types of inductor, but it has a drawback, right? If you look at the cross section, you can see that the flat wire inductor is just a bunch of metal, placed, metal plates with dielectric in between them. So in, Parallel with this inductor, we will have a parasitic capacitance formed by these plates. And it's actually very easy to calculate which capacitance is this. We can look at the self-resonance frequency of the inductor, which is usually given in the data sheet. And since we know the inductance value, we can then approximate that for this inductor, the um, parallel capacitance is about eight picofarads. So, in the end, we have eight picofarads going from the switch node, which is rapidly changing from zero to the supply voltage with this 800 and something megahertz ringing and our output. So this is effectively allowing the high frequency noise to couple into the output. So this is why it's important if you are using a back converter to optimize the input trace 
the switch node, the decoupling gaps, but also the output. Don't forget that there's always parasitic component in your circuit that will uh, increase the irradiated emissions. This is especially the case if your load is outside of your of your PCB. So for, again, lighting applications, which are usually very challenging for EMI, you got a converter, a switching converter on one board, and then you have a very long string of LEDs. This will for sure radiate. So make sure to place a ferrite bead or some sort of low pass filter also on the output of this pack converter. If instead your load is on the same PCB, like you got a microcontroller or a processor, this is then a much lesser effect. Uh, there is no, not so much radiation from the pack converter output. So let's get some conclusions from this presentation. We saw that there are endless DCDC -DC topologies. I only showed a few of them, uh, most typically used um, in our company. But all the common types uh, in low voltage applications are based in half bridge topology. So if you learn how to analyze and what to look for in a half bridge DCDC, -DC, even if you only focus on one topology like a back converter, this will give you the tools then to correctly design most DCDC converters, even with other topologies like post, back post, inverting back, and so on. To minimize electromagnetic emissions, the key is to locate the hot loop, which is the high frequency current loop that will radiate magnetically and minimize its size, uh, parasitic inductance to avoid the, the ringing and the coupling effect by placing the decoupling capacitors very tightly with our half bridge, by placing it far away from connectors and harnesses, and by properly designing and placing filter. So you will need to study if you need an input filter, an output filter, if you need shielding. All these are considerations you need to take uh, to take care when you are designing your product. So I hope you, this was useful to you and interesting. And now uh, we still have some time for a QA session. So feel free to start with uh, some questions. Thank you. Thanks, Francesc. Lots of good info today. Uh, so we only have about five minutes for questions. I see we already have some in, so we'll, we'll jump on those. Uh, and always our number one question, will this uh, presentation be shared? Yes, we will have an email out uh, in the next couple of days with um, a link to the on-demand version of this video, it's being recorded, and then we'll have the presentation itself. So with that, let's get to a real question. Uh, this was about 20 minutes in, Frances. On, on your buck converter example, L and C out were overlapping. Does this imply one or the other is actually placed on the other side of the PCB? Typically, we try to keep all the buck parts on the same side. I would say they're actually not overlapping. So let me get back to the... Is it this one? Uh, I would say I... maybe Give this is go. the... the yeah, I would say this is maybe the 3D view of the, of the board. So it looks like the inductor and the capacitor are overlapping. But uh, if you actually uh, look at the design in 2D, uh, they have some distance. So this inductor has some height, right? Which is uh, overlapping to see out, but everything here is on a single layer. All the components are here on a single layer. You can even get a better layout for uh, discrete uh, switches. Uh, if you place the, if you use more layers for your circuit, but this is a design, we wanted to keep it simple and show something that works on a single layer. So I hope this is what you were uh, referring to. And if not, we can uh, discuss later uh, offline. All right, and then we had a couple of guess, guesses when we were being interact, interactive of, of buck boost. So I think that was a right one. Whoops. Uh, then the next one was, what type of DC caps, V in, V out, do you recommend to utilize? I would say uh, for most converters, it's better to use ceramic capacitors since they have the, the smallest um, 
ESR, so parasitic resistance, ESL, parasitic inductance, for their size, capacitance, and cost. Right, there are other capacitor types that might offer higher capacitance. Um, they are other. There are other capacitor types that offer better uh, parasitic inductances and resistances. But the ceramic capacitors are usually the sweet spot uh, when when you want to also take into consideration cost. Uh, at MPS, in our evaluation boards, we usually only use ceramic capacitors for our input and output caps. Uh, but sometimes you will see also um, polarized capacitors like electrolytic and tantalum, and those are mostly for providing uh, bulk capacitance, which is not so much related to the DCDC converter itself, but more to isolate the boards from the input or uh, or the output from the load. But uh, for the high frequent for the capacitors that are going to carry high frequency energy, uh, ceramic is the way to go. Then there's another, um, which circuit with input capacitors is better? This on the left or the one on the right? I guess it's referring to the symmetric arrangement of the pack. Let me get there. This one, I guess it's referring to this. So, I would say uh, the better one depends on how you look it, at it. The one on the right offers lower parasitic inductances, so the ringing is minimized. But the one on the left is usually a bit easier to route. You only have one pin pin, so you can use a single polygon and then connect your capacitors to ground on each side. Whereas the one on the right forces you to have a V in trace on each side of the device, which sometimes if you, if you don't have enough layers in your PCB might be tricky to, to get. But purely on emissions, the one on the right is better. Great, thanks. And that brings us to the bottom of the hour. I, I do see we have a lot of questions still there and I apologize, um, but we do wanna stay on schedule. Uh, we record all these questions and um, we'll grab them and, and see if we can send you out an email with an answer to those. Um, but uh, I wish we had more time, but I also wanna make sure we, we keep everybody on schedule. So with that, we will thank Francesc um, and we are gonna transition to our second presentation where we have um, Alexander Kumar from Golden Shorts uh, and he's going to cover uh, power electronic measurement challenges. So, Alexander, so, we will hand it to you from here. Thank you very much. I, I hope I'm still loud and clear. You sound great. Perfect. Your, your so, slide's presenting well. So I think we are in good shape. <laughs> then I'll do my very best to stay like that. Yeah, welcome also from my side. It's my pleasure again for being here presenting uh, from Rodin Schwartz the um, measurement equipment view for power electronic measurement challenges. So today um, we'll have a view at typical measurements and how these are affected by some parasitics and what could be done there. Um, of course, losses are important, stability, efficiency, and also the EMC itself. For the main challenges, we'll have these transitions to wide band gap materials. We thus have also a wider dynamic range needed. So we are having higher voltages, but also lower sleep currents in nowadays designs. And thus the question typically is how to qualify all of them with um, the least amount of measurements. Also alignment between the signals is important to get the right measurements for power and especially the losses. But typically we are limited somehow in nowadays designs in the accessibility. And thus we'll also come back to that later on, um, how this affects your measurement. So not all, under all circumstances, you'll have something like that where you'll have a slightly huge cap already. Um, there you could use a spring tip and a passive probe to that, but let's see which concepts could be used there. 
What's important to keep in mind when you're switching to a um, semiconductor with a faster uh, switching inside, you'll have a wider induced spectra there. And thus, um, you might have to consider more effects on your circuitry than ever before. So from the transistor itself, um, it's not only that you'll have the transistor inside, also this transistor has to be connected to the package. And in that case, it doesn't matter if you're using any other techniques like flip, flip chip or something like that. At the end, you'll have some connection, some bolts, um, and these are adding a mutual inductance due to the length. And that's very important. The faster you're switching inside, the more likely you're seeing the effects of these additional parasitics of your housing. So basically, everything can be interpreted as an RLC network. And as we all might remember from our studies, um, we'll have an increasing effect of these parasitics with the frequency. So the faster we are switching, the higher the frequency components induced come, um, the higher will be the effects of these parasitics and thus also the losses caused by these effects. So. With the losses, it's not only the saturation that might occur inside a ferrite material, it's also meant for the general um, inductors that have other resistances and thus are causing other losses inside the systems as well as the caps. For the cabling, there we'll have the same. At the end, it all depends on line theory. So the longer the cable, the more likely we'll have um, transmission or dispersion effects in that way um, caused by the cabling and also the pure construction of these cables. So the quality of the copper inside, the insulation between the single wires and so forth will give you different parasitics in dependency of these cables. And typically today um, we recommend to use only high quality connector cables because otherwise if they're too cheap or maybe also sometimes too old the copper is not that um, clean you'll have higher losses and you'll have a high effect on your measurement caused just by these parasitics inside the cabling itself not only the cables have parasitics also the connectors itself so we'll see different variants of the banana plugs, so with four millimeter connectors here. And of course, the mechanical um, dimensions are somehow fixed, but um, in dependency, how good they are manufactured, these will also have effects um, and differences in their connections by just exchanging some cables. And especially with these additional um, security connector, there's an additional cap um, on there. Also, the parasitics are influenced by the clips. So if we're using the crocodile pincers or other style of these pincer clips, with, which can draw a higher current than the smaller ones, all of these have different geometries, different lengths, and thus um, a huge and significant influence on your achieved measurement result. Overall, we're putting together a um, complex circuit, which will consist of these different um, equivalent circuit diagrams, and thus at the end influence our desired measured step. So the ideal step is drawn blue, and most likely you'll see something like this on your screen. So you'll have additional ringing, maybe also emphasis in the um, overshoot, um, just by adding up these different resonance circuits. So if you'd like to repeat measurements and especially also to compare measurements between each other, also between different days where you do the setup, please always ensure that you're having the same quality grade cables and accessories and also stated in your measurement reports which accessories have been used during the measurement campaign. Otherwise, it might be difficult to reproduce measurements um, because you are having exchanged maybe the crocodile clamps by a, a pincer clip or you used a low quality cable inside um, your setup for the first run. For the second run, you got um, another set of cables and this could already change significantly your measurement results. At the end, also the results are affected um, by the parasitics inside the package. So the major question always will be, 
if you're measuring as slow as do rate coming out of your semiconductor device, um, then you would expect from the data sheet of the switching device, this will be affected by the dispersion coming out of these different effects that I've just discussed. And um, basically you're always adding low pass filters um, by the caps. The inductances will add for the ringing and the resistance of course will cause a voltage drop. Um, and that's why it's very important to take care about all these parameters and not only to consider that there's some oxide at some position and maybe get rid of that by a mechanical stress to the surface um, and also to be aware of these high frequency effects. If we now look at our high voltage differential probe, at the end we'll have our oscilloscope, which is connected by a 50 ohm cable typically to the differential amplifier. And this differential amplifier then um, has its divider network front connected then to your DUT. And that's a very low frequency um, view. As we've just learned, we'll have to extend that a little bit by the cable, um, the pincers, and as well the uh, package itself. And if we we'll consider all these, this will have negative effects on the effective bandwidth. So even though the probe might have 100, 200, 400, 500 megahertz, doesn't matter. Um, the overall circuitry defines the effective um, lowest frequency usable there. And this will call, um, then immediately be seen by additional ringing, changed overshoots, and of course, a reduced common mode rejection ratio. So the first tip from my side would be, if you think you might have an issue with your setup, you could prove the um, effective common mode rejection ratio by measuring plus and minus at the same point. So having both of them clamped to source, let the device switch and have a look there on your screen how much ripple is effectively left on your oscilloscope screen because this gives you immediately the common mode rejection ratio um, on screen. So you don't have to do any maths. You immediately see how large is your effective common mode rejection for this um, current example. Also, the colleagues did a comparison between some really cheap accessories they found in the lab and the standard delivery accessories of the RTZHD. And as can be seen, it makes a significant uh, difference if you're using the high um, value products. So the white curve, you'll see less ringing, less overshoot, or the low priced accessories. And this uh, shall just give you an indication that it's valuable to think about all of these details, because otherwise you might start uh, hunting phantoms in your design. Um, because if you would assume this one is caused by your setup, you might start to be worried about the um, effectiveness as well as the um, longevity of your setup. And that's why it's very important to be aware of these high frequency effects. Also, if we are comparing different um, permutations, so using the ZHD cables clips, with cheap clips, the high quality cables or cheap cables with high quality clips and so forth, you'll see you could adjust your measurement results to your needs, but they will not represent the real values. And in this scenario, you'll see a worst case five volt overshoot, which will mean a measurement error of about 62 to 5%. And even in best case, you're still with 12 to 5% affected for such a high slew rate. And not only the rise time is uh, changing, also if you look at the spectrum, there's a significant difference in the, um, the spectrum visible. So you'll see for the cheap cables and clips, you'll have a low pass filter added. So the higher frequency components are much more attenuated. You also see that you'll have some gain inside for the usage of cheap cables with the high quality clips. And for the high quality cables and cheap clips, you'll see also a different spectrum. And that's very important to be aware of. Um, it's always valid, bullshit in, bullshit out. So if you have a crappy cable, please um, consider to replace them um, on the long term or even on the short term through appropriate new cables um, from a standard vendor of these. As mentioned already, the packaging has a high impact today on what we are seeing there. So 
we know already these BGA, so ball grid array packages from the semiconductor devices for quite a while. So in the range of com computing, system on chips and so forth, um, these no longer have any uh, footprints like a TO package or something like that. You'll always have these ball grid arrays. And if we see the development of the different packages today, so the TO, you might get some silicon carbide, gallium nitride devices in that form factor due to legacy reasons, but the more commonly used ones are no longer having these leads there, and that's due to these parasitic effects. So, so one would like to avoid that you are having additional inductance added to get the devices switching as fast as possible and to also avoid um, excessive ringing inside your system. And that's how it looks like. So for the slow inductance packages, you'll see a rectangular signal. So switching on and off looks quite nicely. Um, if you'll have a gate resistance added to these induct high inductance packages, this looks also a little bit better. But if you still stay with the older packages, the faster the semiconductor gets, the more resonances you will see. And this will give you also some headache for EMC purposes, also for the heating losses and the parasitics that are um, occurring there. At the end, we'll have a step coming from our semiconductor. Then we'll go to the package, to the test port, and of course, at the end, we'll also have there the cabling going then to the high voltage differential probe, scope, and so forth. So all of this adds up to a distorted waveform. Uh, we'll see at the end. So we shall never forget that these dispersion effects are always um, to be considered. And that's very important. If you're measuring here at the outer dimensions a much slower slew rate than you would expect from your um, device, this might be caused by exactly these effects. And typical rule of thumb is that even from the fast switching devices, you'll see at the outer testing points not more than about 100 to 200 megahertz of um, significant energy inside the signals. That's all due to the slow pass behavior of the connections in between. So even though if we are using new packaging technology technologies, we still have the point of this limited accessibility. So we are unable to connect directly at the outer pins of these devices. Also current measurements, we'll have to use maybe a shunt resistor or we'll need some structure where we could, which we could use as a coupling port. We'll have these connectors, even if they're MMCX, those are quite bulky in comparison to these little, small, tiny uh, semiconductor devices. And that's why measuring these signals clearly and having a um, good match to the initial expected values becomes more tough just um, when you're also thinking, okay, if you have not considered to have a test port or test point here on the board, um, if you're adding these connectors, wire, a, a short wire to the testing points, Please always keep in mind that each millimeter of these wires will give you an additional one nanohenry of inductance into your system. So worst case, you're, you're adding so much inductance, so so much load that these um, circuits are becoming resonant and then you might destroy even your semiconductor by just um, adding the test point. So far, so good for the voltages. Let's jump to the currents. I guess you're all familiar with these type of current uh, clamps, uh, more or less famous thanks to Hiyuki current probes there. And for these, if you look in the data sheet, you'll have a certain bandwidth, sensitivity, maximum current, but you're limited in the accessibility. So you'll have to ensure that you'll have a structure where you could clamp this huge and bulky thing about. So um, in addition, you'll have saturation effects occurring. So you'll have a ferrite um, in, so the ferrite inside the current clamp gives you a um, translation of the flux and the possibility to measure the current on the primary winding, which will be the DUT um, fed to the secondary winding going through the circuitry and then down to the connection to the oscilloscope. 
and we'll have a look on the concept of the insertion impedance and the positioning effects of these um, current probes. Basically, in easiest case, a current probe is a transformer. As mentioned, we'll have a primary winding, we'll have a secondary winding, maybe several secondary windings um, around this ferrite core, and then we'll get somehow a resistance um, that we are inserting into our DOT. And if you'll think about these um, transformer equations, we'll see that the uh, introduced inductance or more generic, the introduced impedance um, to the system is somehow translated with the number of windings in that way. And that's very important to keep in mind. So if you'll have a measurement equipment coming with about 50 ohms on that side, having a requirement to have a maximum of, of one ohm load on this primary winding, you'll need at least a one by seven transmission ratio. And if you'll have higher impedances, then you, this um, transmission ratio has to be even higher. When thinking about these equations a little bit further, we also see that there's this arrow on these probes. So first thing for these probes is as we can open and close them that you ensure that they stay closed um, at the top so that you really push this one to the end. Otherwise there will be a small gap. So this gap would be then um, reducing the effectiveness of the ferrite and thus all these calibrations that have been made would no longer be valid. And also the losses would be increased um, just by the ineffectiveness of the ferrite inside. If we now look for the position, so if we have a small wire going through this one, it could be easily in one of these corner cases and every permutation in between. And if you'll see high frequency effects can already be observed starting at about 200, 300 kilohertz. So if you'll think about today's switching topologies where you have easily about two, three, four megahertz of switching frequency, if you'd like to, um, strongly depends on your position, um, how your measurement is affected at the end. And that's very important to keep in mind. If you'll have the chance to get a certain adapter in between to fix the position, this will significantly improve the reproducibility of your measurement. Also, if you'll think about using a Rogowski probe, typically these are thought to be independent of how they're oriented to the DUT. That's more or less right. If you only consider the inner uh, conductor here, as soon as you start to consider the coupling to the outer world, you'll see that this one is also strongly depending on the orientation to the DUT, to the heatsink, and so forth. So also please be aware for the Rogowski coils. Um, these are highly resonant structures. So yes, we have a weak coupling between the DUT and the measurement system itself, but we are having a long wire in between, which is then taking a lot of turns inside with the Rogowski coil. Also inside there's a feedback loop um, to ensure that the loop is closed. And thus these systems are highly resonant and also highly depending um, to its resonant environment by the cross coupling effects. And as you can see here, you'll see different uh, readings in terms of the current, you'll see different um, overshoots, ringings, modulations on that. So it strongly depends on the position. Going back to the um, traditionally used current probes using a ferrite core inside, if you look in the data sheets, you'll find these saturation curves. And please ensure that you're not exceeding these values. And that's quite um, important to be aware of. We'll have a derating over frequency because the losses of the ferrites will increase over frequency and thus these probes will heat up. And in a worst case scenario, I've seen that already several times, um, the current probe will melt down because they got an excessive amount of current seen on the primary side, which caused too many losses. And then um, yeah, you'll have to tell your boss why you need another current probe. So please be aware of these derating curves and check upfront um, what frequency range will most likely be induced by checking for the maximum slew rates as well as the switching frequencies inside your system. 
If you'll further the, um, make a deep dive into the construction of these and why there's this arrow on top. So basically a, a current probe will be looking like this. So primary winding, secondary winding will have termination. But all the probes on the market are not starting for a certain AC value. If you'll take these from um, Hiyoki, for example, um, or also from RDS, these are AC DC zero flux um, probes with Hall elements. So what does this already state in the name? We'll have a Hall element to measure the uh, DC. And this one then goes to an amplifier to inject there the inverse flux to avoid saturation effects to the core. And due to that, it's important to know in which direction the current is flowing, because otherwise um, the circuitry is not able to compensate for the DC flux and also the low frequency flux um, deviations there. For Rogowski, I already mentioned the base construction. We'll have the integrator circuit at the bottom. Then we'll have these different um, high amount of windings, which is a soft coupling because we have no longer a ferrite core, which um, then translates the flux of the current to the orientation of our um, probe itself. And yeah, in the middle, we'll have this um, line back. And as you could assume, this one could easily go in the range of several 10 centimeters or even meters of cable inside the probe. And thus the usable effective bandwidth is limited by the integrator and the amount of cable up front. Last but not least, the shunt resistor. Um, these ones are quite convenient because they will offer you the highest possible bandwidth and also the most discrete system for AC as well as DC, because you could do calibrations upfront on these resistors. Um, nevertheless, when using a shunt resistor, please always keep in mind if you would like to do efficiency measurements, you always have to choose between the measurement of the right current or the right voltage. So in that way, you'll have to split up your efficiency measurements to at least two measurements one where you're measuring just the current of the system and the second one where you're measuring behind the uh, resistor or even without the shunt resistor to get the right losses of your system. Otherwise, the dissipation of the resistor itself plus the probe would give you a wrong reading and thus you would say you'll have higher losses of your system um, due to not having accounted these losses correctly. So summing that up, um, we have different types of um, current probes. Um, the standard current transformer, the zero flux, um, plus the compensated um, flux uh, sensors. We have Rogowski coils, we have shunt resistors. And as you can see, each of these methods has the pros and cons. Um, basically, for these standard current transformers, they could be constructed for kilo amperes inside but um, you'll have to ensure you'll have a test position also for these others uh, where you'll use clamps. Um, they are quite intrusive, so you'll always have to add a, a certain amount of wire for being able to connect the probe or you'll have to use the connection cables to your inverter. In terms of bandwidth, they are also somehow okay or limited, strongly depending on the type. Um, and there, in terms of bandwidth, the shunt resistor is typically outperforming each of the other systems. But still, you'll have to make sure you'll have a certain test point considered for these shunt resistors for being able to add them. Otherwise, you'll have also to separate your um, lines to get that one in. At the end, there is no perfect uh, solution right now on the market. There's a lot of research going on to find some new um, systems, like for example, these infinity loops and so forth. But um, there's no standard solution right now. And you'll have to be aware of all these pros and cons to decide which of these systems gives uh, me the most insights into my system itself and how to consider that for the measurements of efficiency and so forth, that you're not doing the right calculations of voltage multiplied with current. So that you might have to do that into separate measurements and afterwards align them. This brings me already to the end of my part of the presentation today, and I'll be happy to answer your questions.
All right, thank you very, very much. Uh, so as um, I think we've mentioned before, you can mouse over the QA icon on the bottom of your Zoom webinar interface, and you are um, able to type in questions right there. Uh, the, the number one one we always get is, is the presentation gonna be available? And yes, um, it, will be, it will be available. Um, we will send them out via email in the next couple of days, or you can always go to monolithicpower.com forward slash webinars and be able to find them all there. All right, but let's jump into some of the questions we have gotten. Uh, would there be, well, uh, would there be improvement using the LVDS interfacing in send signal to re to a receiver? Um, th this could be one solution to avoid some of these um, artificial cabling effects. But at the end, um, then you would have to build in the high quality ADCs there. You would have to ensure the stability in terms of grounding. So it's just a shift of um, drawbacks in that way. And it's more easy to construct these transmission lines and consider the um, accessories there um, for a high quality to ensure that your measurement system is not affecting the measurement too much. So there, I would always say, in general, yes, it's possible to make that with a remote head sample or with a remote sampling head, but the drawbacks will be very significant. So I'm not sure if this would be uh, the best benefit. Great, thank you. Next up, we had, how would you perform a measurement of drain source and gate source voltage of a high side MOSFET? And then goes on to say, I soldered directly on a MOSFET drain source and gate source pins, twisted cables, and then connected to my differential probe. And I'm seeing some weird effects on my gate source signal, maybe due to some parasitic effect. Mm -hmm. Y yes, so um, th that's a slide I did not have in the slide deck today. Um, but if you're twisting or not twisting the cabling, um, changes heavily the um, ca capacitive or inductive loading of your system. So if you're twisting them, you're increasing the inductance. If you're leaving them untwisted, you'll have a higher capacitance. Um, so as generic rule of thumb, the only thing that um, helps to press down resonances overall is to shorten the cables to a certain minimum. And um, th that's the only recommendation I can give here um, to go for a, in as short as possible connection. And um, then also consider the input impedances of the probe. So if you might have another um, active probe that could be used with a lower input capacitance, this might also solve some issue here. So it's very important um, that, that you'll keep the cabling as short as possible. The idea of soldering as close as possible to the um, drain source or gate source um, is good, but um, yeah, somehow limited and strongly depending on the package size. So in this case, you're lucky that you have the chance to get some soldering there. Okay, next we had adding a small RF connector to the board as a test point might be helpful. I guess maybe a comment more than a question, but if you have something to address there. Yes, so um, basically for um, a testing point, this would be helpful. On the other hand, um, if you leave an open connector in your system later on, um, this would be additional cost to the design per piece. If you remove that one later on, um, you might have a change in the parasitics of your PCB, and this might cause, to a, cause a different behavior. So um, typically, we have the recommendation right now to have two designs. So the first one, which is specifically for test purposes, where you will have this dedicated test points in, and the second one will be later on used for the um, production where you do a last verification with some um, soldering made where you'll have the connectors added by a small wire there. But um, at the end, if you'll have open structures, um, then you always have a chance for EMI issues inside the system. So even if it is small, these disturbances might cause a, another coupling path 
by providing other um, geometries. So that's why it's a pros and cons um, and has to be considered if this connector could stay in and you might add another um, cap on that to ensure also is um, isolation, then this could be done. But um, at the end, you'll have to judge if this could stay in the complete product. Otherwise, you might have changes in the system behavior afterwards due to um, getting that connector out and maybe also changing the complete PCB. And then all the measurements you made with a connector would be more or less just guessing how it behaves with the initial design then of the product, real product. Okay. Uh, can input bulk decoupling and low pass filtering be done simply with bulk ceramic capacitance? For example, uh, two, um, 100, uh, UF 1260 capacitors. Um, basically there I'm not, not, not the hardware engineer. Um, of course, adding low passes um, can help to suppress. But on the other hand, um, from a test equipment perspective, um, I'd like to qualify the system um, like it is. So typically um, that question has to be answered from the uh, view of the outer world. So if you'll have to ensure that your switch mode power supply at the end is not too sensitive for some burst surge events or to um, high frequency coupling inside the system, that's a different story. Um, when you're talking about the test points, um, if you're adding caps there, um, you're adding an AC coupling. So then you would only be able to measure the frequency components with some attenuation over the cap itself um, with the measurement system. And so at the end, um, I would not recommend to do so, um, to add dedicated test um, caps in that way. The probe shall be chosen that is able to handle these offset voltages. And there are also optical isolated probes available, which also deliver a very high common mode rejection and isolation if this is needed for analysis on highly isolated um, switch mode power supplies. So generic answer, no, I would not make dedicated test points using caps. Um, if there are some that could be reused, that's good. But um, everything for these low pass filters and so forth at the connections to the outer world, that's part of the design of the um, switch mode power supply, not for the measurement equipment. Next up we have, do you think the shunt can't achieve a precision that's the same as a flux gate? Many shunts pro prove very low TCR. Um, th that's strongly depending on which type of shunt. There are many manufacturers around. And um, the flux gates are also somehow limited in terms of um, usability. So as mentioned, there is no good solution available currently. And that's why you will have to dis decide for the solution with the least drawbacks for your measurement task. That's the only recommendation I can give you. Thank you. Um, so I think going back to the prior question about twisting, mm -hmm. um, and they're making a twisting cables increase capa capac capacitance and reduce mutual inductance. So. Um, <laughs> Um, if I phrased it the other way around, um, I would be sorry, um, but I could add the slides for the um, handout so that there uh, this information is added. Then right. we'll have the correct right thing and not having me uh, bust up something. All right. So, and, and just to be clear here, we're going to send out all the presentations in the next couple of days. And so we'll make sure that we get it added there and address your question that way. Uh, next up, how would you rate coax cables compared to twisted versus non-twisted wires for these types of measurements? 
So th this again depends on the voltage rating. So if we are talking about one, two, three, four, five volts, um, the coaxial cable would at least not have an isolation issue. If we're talking about 100, 300, 400, 500 volts, these cables would need to have a certain isolation distance and thus get very bulky, unflexible, and um, yeah, more or less unusable in that way. Um, second thing to be aware of is if you'll have a coaxial cable with a certain geometry, this could add a lot more of capacitance to your design um, than using the um, twisted pair lines. So here again, um, it, it all depends on the um, voltage levels and there's not a um, true yes or no. So it's not always the best solution to use a coaxial cable and it's not always the best solution to use twisted pair banana plugs. So it's all up to um, the system behavior at the end, um, but the higher the voltage gets, um, the more important is the question, do we really have to see the full offset voltage? So if we're measuring over a shunt, we'll just have the delta um, when using an isolated probe. If you are using a high voltage differential probe, we always see the complete voltage difference, including the offset voltage. And there the uh, coaxial cable would see um, a voltage difference, including the offset too. So there the cable would no longer be appropriate in that way. Thank you. Uh, what kind of test points do you suggest? Oh, that, that, that's a tricky one. Um, so the test points, as mentioned, um, could be pads, could be um, caps, could be um, soldering points um, where you will have the connection of your semiconductor itself. The more important thing is, that you'll know for certain test points um, that they are somehow aligned between each other so that the time difference um, is the same for the traveling of your uh, incident steps there. And um, if you're going far away from your semiconductor with your test point, this would have the drawback that you'll have a lot of inductance in between again and capacitance depending on which frequency range we are talking there. Um, and due to that, you would see the dispersion effects of your um, signal traveling from the semiconductor to your test point. So these shall be as close as possible at your um, device under test. Otherwise, you'll have to ensure, and this doesn't matter if you do characterizations using a win A or using a simulation to get these, um, you'll have to be sure that your system is not affected or corrupted by the definition of these test points. And that's most important here. Great, thank you. Um, not sure how to, not sure what that word is, how to for, for measurement of voltage or current in a double pulse test. Um, yeah, so so here again, um, first of all, the target for the design of this double pulse measurement shall be for having reproducibility and also accuracy achieved inside the system. So um, this is more or less related to the test point question uh, from my perspective here. Um, if we have a double pulse tester where we use a generic coupling plane, there typically we'll have some defined test points for current as well as the voltages applied to the DUT. Um, and then we are able to plug and unplug the DUT there by some robots and push them into the connectors. So um, here again, the major story will be, you'll have to ensure that you'll know your boundary conditions in that way. And then you could do what you'd like to do. 
in this meaning. So for the double pulse test itself, there is no specific need um, to have a dedicated, high, highly sophisticated uh, probing fixture, as long as you know how your voltage and current are related to each other in the timing perspective, you could do all the calculations for the energy losses as well as the correlations of your signals um, by looking for the Miller plateau and thus correlating it with the current and voltage there also. So also the efforts for calibration are quite different in dependency of how you do the tests and how the characteristic sorry, the characteristic um, behaviors inside your traces are visible. If you see a lot of ringing um, inside your signal, typically you cannot do any correlations. If you'll have a nicely shaped curve, then you could do these alignments um, easily afterwards in a post-processing. Great, thank you. Um, next one was, what about no contact testing like an antenna? Isn't that the real test? How is this product going to affect the one and the 100 megahertz receiver nearby listening to a broadcast radio? So um, that, that, that's a yes and a no. Um, if we're using antennas, these antennas are tied to a certain physical principle. So if we're using dipoles, those are mainly tied to having a traveling wave with the e e so the electrical field perpendicular to the magnetic field there. If we are using a, a magnetic field probe, uh, so a magnetic loop antenna or a near field probe um, constructed in that way, these are relying on an AC current flowing initially on the um, DOT. Um, and we'll have to differentiate here two things. So the aspect brought up here is investigating the electromagnetic um, compatibility of the devices. And here also only the um, electromagnetic interference testing. So that we are ensuring that no radiation is um, taking place that could be harmful for the surrounding. Um, the previous things I've been talking about mainly in the presentation were about um, doing efficiency measurements, doing the qualification of the base function of the switch mode power supply. And there, in a first step, I don't care a damn about EMI in that way. Because I'd like to ensure that this thing is switching, first of all, providing uh, output power by a certain input power. Second step would be to ensure that I'm not feeding too much high frequency components to the input, not getting them at the output. So everything that is cable bound emissions there. And last step will then be to investigate, okay, how much of these high frequency energy that I'm generating by switching between one and zero, so high and low potential is radiated to the environment and do I have to take care about that? And then you'll have to hunt down, is this caused by direct radiation out of the package or is this caused by the harness in the surrounding? And these are many different steps. So yes, it is one test to use antennas. This would be typically pre-compliance tests using leafy probes or going to an EMC lab in an anechoic chamber to see what's going on there. But then um, you would completely ignore that you also have the um, physical contacts, the harness, the grid connections and so forth. These have also to be tested on top. So the system itself has to be ensured to meet all these um, regulatory affair, affairs there. Um, and Therefore, you'll have to take care about the conducted as well as radiated emissions. But upfront, first of all, you'll have to ensure that this thing is doing what it's intended to do before you'll take care about the unintended things like in the EMI. Great, thank you. For WBG power devices such as GAN, would you recommend the usage of a Rogowski coil for the drain current measurement? So um, th this heavily depends on your um, needs. As shown in the presentation, these Rogowski coils are somehow resonant structures. Um, 
they are depending on their cross coupling for these higher frequencies. But also, if you remember the beginning, um, we'll have anyhow low pass filters up front. So it's kind of unlikely that you'll have a propagation of your maybe one, let's say one picosecond step inside your um, switching device. Um, coming out of that package via the uh, bond wires and so forth because the inductors are added by the chip connections or package connections inside as well as the outer world will always act as a low pass and the experience says that we are not expecting more significantly more than 100 megahertz of frequency components if you're lucky having very tiny structures and so forth maybe 200 but that will be the real high end um, of the um, cable bound emissions, even for SIG and GAN. I have not seen something much faster yet. Um, it changes the smaller the geometry sketch. So if we're talking about testing of um, switch mode power supplies integrated into a SOC or into a CPU using wafer needles and so forth, that's a complete different story but I guess that's not the question um, that was targeting to. Great. Um, let's see. How would you measure voltage ringing on a SW pin of sync buck converter that, that converts HV EG 400 volts down to 48 volts? What kind of probe would you use? So um, basically for 480 volts, um, of course, a, a high voltage differential probe could be used to do that on the input side. On the output side, a standard differential probe with an additional um, 10 by 1 um, attenuator could be used um, to, you, to get the signals out. And um, I would make a split between these two probes due to the way lower capacitance of the um, high-speed differential probe. So a standard differential probe you would typically use to probe a CAN LIN um, signal there. So any differential signal that matches to the bandwidth. And um, I would use the other probe due to the high input voltage um, needs there. Um, so this always depends on which test point you'd like to define. If you're going for the high side gate and also the uh, 480 volts to mid voltage, then of course a high voltage differential probe is needed. If you'll have an isolated um, supply design, then the question would be if a common mode rejection of a standard differential probe is sufficient or not. And that's um, a second part of the story. So there an optical isolated probe could be used, but this strongly depends on the isolation against um, ground. So there, um, I would always use an active probe as first statement, and of course, choose the appropriate probe to the input voltage levels there. Great, thanks, Alex. Uh, that was the last of our questions. I do see a couple of people had raised their hands. If you do have an actual question, look for the Q&A button. Uh, at the bottom of your Zoom webinar interface. Click on that and you should be able to just type it in. Um, I see that we do have, um, oh, that's the one we just did. Um, so, so we do have about uh, nine minutes before we start our next presentation. So if there was anything else that you wanted to ask, um, please go ahead and fire away. So we got a comment thanking for the webinar. You're very welcome. Um, remember everyone that these will be available on demand. So um, we will send you out an email in the next couple of days. It takes us a little bit of time to process the video, uh, but then we send that out to everyone or you can always go to monolithicpower.com forward slash webinars. And from there, um, be able to see all the old ones that we've done. And there's there's been quite a few on um, EMI. So if you want to look back through some of the old ones, just uh, take a scroll there. All right. I think that is our last question. Um, so uh, we will get started in eight minutes.
with uh, Arturo Mediano, and he is going to cover uh, EMI debugging and radiated emissions with oscilloscopes. Uh, and it's a highly interactive presentation. So he shares a, a lot of, um, you know, he's got multi-camera angles to show how he's doing everything. It's a pretty engaging one. We had tons of questions when we did this last week. So I'm not sure if you if you were here for that, but um, so I, I do hope everyone stays with us and we'll get started again here in seven more minutes.
All right. Looks like we are at the bottom of the hour. So Arturo, if you wanna check your sound and your presentation, we'll get uh, set up here and ready to go with you. Hello, can you listen to me? You sound great. Excellent, excellent. Thank you for your introduction. So let me share the screen. Let me see if this is the screen. And uh, let me know if you see the screen correctly. I am seeing your slide. Okay, so this is the topic for today. EMI debugging with uh, oscilloscopes, part two. We will talk today about uh, radiated emissions. Last day in the first webinar, we were talking about conducted emissions. Okay, so we start. Let's go. Well, um, thank you for attending the webinar. And uh, thank you to MPS and Robert Sarre again for inviting me to participate in this uh, interesting workshop. So let's talk about radiated emissions and how we can make the bugging with oscilloscopes. Uh, let's start with the general ideas about radiated emissions. What you do when trying to pass a radiated emission test is to prepare some kind of setup similar to what you see in the screen. Basically, your device under test will be in some specific position, usually on top of a table at some specific height. The table will be non-conductive and the table can rotate 360 degrees. Basically at some distance, usually this distance is typically 30 at uh, three meters or 10 meters. In some applications like automotive application, automotion, uh, we use less than one, less than two meters, no? Uh, this, is, this can create uh, some kind of problems when measuring radiated emissions, but Let's uh, talk about this uh, later. Well, uh, if you put at three 10 meters the antenna, remember that usually when measuring radiated emissions, the antenna looks like this. It's an antenna that we build with rods. Uh, basically, antennas with rods are used to measure electric field, not magnetic field. When we measure magnetic field, usually we use loops. So when you are working with the biconical or with the log periodic antenna, remember you are trying to measure electric field. And this electric field, this electric field that usually we can represent in dB microvolts per meter or something like that, electric field units, is converted to microvolts or dB microvolts, that is a voltage in the output of the antenna. And then the signal goes to the uh, receiver instrument. Uh, this uh, conversion is, uh, can be calibrated, can be measured, and uh, create what we call the transducer factor of the antenna or the antenna factor. Why we don't measure a magnetic field? Basically, the idea is that when we are in the far field, electric and magnetic fields are orthogonal. That means that uh, the ratio between the two fields is equal to a constant, 377 ohms. Why 377 ohms? Because the uh, uh, wave impedance, the ratio between the electric and the magnetic field in the far field is the result of this calculation. This is the permittivity and the permeability of the uh, media where the signal is being propagated. So the wave impedance is not related with the circuit that was creating the signal. Is the same if the circuit was a high impedance circuit or a low impedance circuit, it's the same. The idea is that the ratio is controlled by the media. And that is because measuring electric field, we can calculate the magnetic field. And this is when we are in the far field. So when you will receive in the far field some specific frequency or some specific signal that is important, that is because in your device under test, you have a good antenna to radiate the signal to the far field. Uh, the distance between the near and the far field is uh, something that is not easy to calculate. It's uh, dependent of things like, for example, the size of the device under test. But if you want to do some kind of uh, calculation, you can consider that it's something like lambda over six, lambda over two pi, you know? So 
what you can do when debugging uh, EMI problems is to go close to the circuit. It's like you are Sherlock Holmes and you can try to analyze the circuit in some way that uh, give you a clues to apply fixes. You can use different probes. You can see the signals in the time or the frequency domain, and you can make changes in your design to minimize the signal you are detecting in the far field. Remember, what you are detecting in the near field perhaps is not in the far field, because to be in the far field, you need a good antenna. So signals detected in the near field perhaps will be in the far field, not always. But signals you are detecting in the far field will be, will be uh, found when you are analyzing the near field. And this is what we will try to do, is to understand how the circuit is radiating the signals and how we can go with different probes to analyze the circuit in the near field. So in our product, consider that we are failing in this um, way. No? You can see a vertical scale and horizontal scale. In the horizontal scale, what we find typically is frequency. And the frequency starts in some, fre in some value, like for example, 30 megahertz, and we can stop here in one gigahertz. Sometimes we go to higher frequencies like six gigahertz or perhaps 18 gigahertz, depending on your application, military, automotive, or if your product is including some kind of radio frequency device, blah, blah, blah. You will see some kind of limits, uh, commercial uh, limits for uh, industrial, depending on the area of the world where you will be. And then you will see uh, some kind of uh, emissions. If you identify emissions like this one, uh, let me take another color, something like this, this or this or this, narrowband emissions, Usually these narrowband emissions are coming from some switching circuit, for example, digital electronics or uh, power electronics. No? But the problem we will be analyzing today is when we obtain something like this mountain. No? You can see here that at some specific frequency range close to FM radio, uh, this is 100 megahertz is exactly here, we are over the limit some decibels. Remember from my previous uh, seminar, the, the day number one, we were talking about trying to go with the emissions below the limits of at least six decibels, no? To have some kind of a margin, no? If you are close to the limit or you are one dB below the limit, this can be dangerous. So who is creating this signal? We talk about this in the first webinar, but we, basically we have three different possibilities. The first possibility is that this, they are signals in your design. For example, clocks, driving signals, oscillators, harmonics of your oscillators, blah, blah, blah. The second possibility is to have some kind of resonance. The most typical resonance effect we have in electronics is what we call ringing. Eh? You have inductance, you have capacitance from the parasitic components, uh, for, for the parasitic in the uh, packages of the components, from the parasitics in the layout, uh, in the transformers, in, 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 in general, in, in the way you are building your circuit. And finally, the next possibility, the last possibility is to create a parasitic oscillator. You know? When you put in your system, the input and the output one close to the other, you have gain and you are creating an oscillator that is unintended. So this is what we will be uh, trying to solve today. And to the, make this uh, analysis, I will be using an RTO6 oscilloscope. The uh, main advantages of the oscilloscope versus other instruments is that for debugging, the oscilloscope will give you the time and the frequency domain of your signal. And additionally, if you have several channels, here I have four channels, we will be able to uh, combine different probes to um, analyze the, the system and to be able to see if we can apply some uh, um, uh, fixes. The bandwidth of the oscilloscope uh, usually must be for radiated emissions at least at the maximum frequency you want to measure. I don't know, one gigahertz, six gigahertz, something like that. And you need to have a good FFT. With a good FFT, you don't need the spectrum analyzer for debugging, and you will be able to work very easily like you will see in the demos. 
So let's go to the to the um, first part of the presentation where we will be describing the uh, product. In my product, I have some electronics that is inside of this metallic box. In theory, the metallic box is a good uh, system for um, uh, for sealing. No, inside of the box, I have an electronics that be, is being powered by this cable. You can see that I have a red and a black wire, and they are one close to the other, very close one to the other. And if you see with the camera, the power is coming from this uh, voltage here. This is something like uh, 12, 20 volts. It's the same system that I was uh, debugging, uh, doing the debugging in the in the first uh, webinar. And you can see here the RTO6 in front of the device under test. Obviously, I need to work in a small uh, area. So you can see with the camera uh, and in, in a real application, uh, you will work in your laboratory in, in a better way, okay? So let's consider that we are interested in measuring radiated emissions. The first thing we need is one antenna. So let's go again to the slides. And when you are trying to make debugging with one antenna, you will go to something like this. Remember that we, you will have an antenna with uh, rods and the longer rods in this antenna, this area here, the longer rods, will be used to measure the lower frequencies, higher uh, lambda wavelength. And the uh, smaller, the shorter uh, 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 rods will be used for measuring the high frequency, in this case, six gigahertz. So from with one antenna, you will be able to measure from 30 megahertz to six gigahertz without changing the antenna. The, the antenna in this picture is in vertical polarization. That means will be sensitive to electric field that is vertical, vertical considering uh, the reference of the floor. No, If we want to measure the horizontal polarization, what we do is to put the antenna in horizontal polarization, No, something like this. And this is typical when we are measuring in radiated emissions because in the external lab, in the official lab, what you, what you are trying to measure is the worst condition in emissions. No and the antenna must be in vertical or horizontal, trying to identify if the emission is coming horizontal or vertical. If we go to the previous slide, in this slide, for example, I have the antenna in vertical polarization. So this antenna will be very sensitive to electric fields that are going in vertical, no? So this electric field is being propagated through the space, is being attenuated, but when the electric field goes to the antenna, uh, in um, create a current in the rod, and this current is what you, we are measuring in our receiver. But if the electric field is horizontal, because the antenna is in vertical orient orientation, we will not be able to um, induct, create this inducted current, and the measurement will be theoretically zero, okay? Usually this measurement is done in a clean area, in a, a sealed area, in a chamber, or in an open area test site, trying to minimize the possibility to have external uh, noise from the environment or reflections in walls or in metallic structures that are close to the uh, setup. So here is my setup here. Uh, let me try to switch uh, on the light. So perhaps it's better. Now it's starting to be late here in Spain. So uh, you see here the uh, setup, and now we will start with the antenna. For my uh, demo, I will be using this antenna. It's a small antenna. You can see that I have rods. Obviously, it's very, very short. No? It's very nice for traveling or for demos. If I reduce the length of the antenna, I, I am able to tune the antenna for higher frequencies. If you increase the length of the arms of the antenna, you will be able to measure lower frequencies. Obviously, to have a good antenna for very low frequencies, the size of the antenna will be very big. If I put the antenna in this position, I am measuring uh, horizontal electric fields. If I put the antenna in this position, I am measuring electric field uh, that is vertical. No, uh, In my demo, I will not be very uh, scientific. I will put the antenna in this position, and we will connect the output of the antenna to channel number one, okay? So this is what we have, basically, okay? So uh, now 
we are able to switch on the device. But before switching on the device, my recommendation, let me show you the screen of the oscilloscope. This is what we see here, is the output of the uh, antenna. So the antenna is measuring electric field from the environment and is converting this electric field in a voltage that is going to the channel number one of the oscilloscope that you can see in yellow color. This is uh, in the uh, oscilloscope in yellow color, uh, time domain in the horizontal axis. So something that is interesting to do is to see the spectrum of this signal before switching on my device. So I go to the menu of the oscilloscope and I can go to the FFT. In the FFT, in the top menu, I can start at some frequency, for example, 80 megahertz. Let me start in 80 megahertz. Remember, we know that the, um, our emissions are uh, in 120, 130 megahertz, more or less, from the previous slide. And let me stop in uh, 500 megahertz or 300 megahertz, for example. Uh, remember that if you increase a lot the uh, bandwidth, uh, the, the, the area you want to analyze, the sweeping uh, of your instrument or the time for make calculations will be longer, no? So I'm going to measure from 80 megahertz to 300 megahertz. And we will use a resolution bandwidth that is, for example, let me use one megahertz, okay? And we go to channel number one. You see how useful is the oscilloscope to see the FFT. The top trace is the time domain. The bottom trace is the frequency domain from 80 megahertz to 300 megahertz. Obviously, I can increase the reduce the volts per division in the top uh, uh, signal, but try to avoid the signal going out of the screen. If not, the FFT will be uh, destroyed. The, the FFT calculation will be um, uh, not destroyed. It will be um, something like if the signal is saturated. So the results will not be good. You can see that I have a lot of signals in the environment. Okay? Obviously, if I am not working in a sealed chamber, I have noise in the environment, but if I want to identify signals that are smaller in this area, you can you see that some signal appears now and then disappear. No, this this is something that is in the environment. Okay, so let me go to the FFT menu and see what happens if I reduce the resolution bandwidth from one megahertz to, for example, ten kilohertz. You are going to uh, see uh, two important things. The first thing you will identify is that the noise floor is reduced. So we will be able to measure easier signals that are small, that are below this uh, uh, crazy area. No? The second important thing is that the reducing the resolution bandwidth, you will be able to have more um, frequency resolution. No? You will be able to identify what energy is inside below some specific mountain. So for example, if you see this area here eh, on the left, you see that below this area, I have energy, but it's very difficult to see at what specific frequencies really I have energy, no? So going to 10 kilohertz, that this is what I am going to introduce now, 10 kilohertz, then you can see that the noise floor is reduced and I am able to identify more signals, okay? Obviously, I am starting in 80 megahertz because I wanted you to see this area here, 80, to 108 megahertz is the area where I am measuring FM radio stations, no? And obviously in the higher frequency range, I have other emissions from the environment in my laboratory, okay? So this is the ambient noise. Let me switch on my device. When I switch on my device, this is what I get. Look at this, the time of my signal is going out of the screen. So it's very important for a good FFT to reduce the amplitude of the signal so you can see easily in the uh, screen. So now the device under test is on. Let me switch off. We switch off. Now I switch on. So clearly what I am creating is this big mountain that is over the 108 megahertz of the FM band. This is the area where we are failing, okay? So this mountain you see here is a broadband emission in this area. And obviously I have more emissions here, but consider for example, that this frequency between uh, 130, 150 megahertz is the area where you are over the limits and you want to reduce these emissions. So if we go to the camera, the idea is that this energy is coming from my system and it's going to the antenna. 
So one of the, th obviously in, in your laboratory, the distance between the antenna and the device under there will be three meters or something like that. And additionally, the antenna will be uh, bigger in size, okay? So the first consideration you have is what, who is radiating this signal? You have several possibilities. One is the electronics inside of the product. Second is the slots or apertures you have in your enclosure is metallic. Obviously, if the enclosure is plastic, you will have a lot of emissions. And finally, we have the cable. And to understand what happened here, I am going to consider, and not always this is clear, perhaps you need to do some uh, experiments to uh, identify your possibilities. Uh, what I am going to consider is that the electronics inside is shielded. So the electronics inside is not being uh, coupled to the antenna easily. But perhaps the energy is going out through the slots or the apertures. But then you need to compare the frequencies you are experimenting uh, the problem with the size of the slots. In my case, if we consider that we are in around 100, 200 megahertz, the wavelength for 100, 200 megahertz is perhaps something like three meters. No, uh, If you consider three meters, 1.5 meters, you will discover that the slots I have in the enclosure are very small. So it's not easy for these slots or for these uh, uh, um, apertures to be able to radiate with efficiency a 100, 200 megahertz signal. So in this frequency range, usually the problems are coming from cables, right? not always. And especially if the antenna is very close to the device under test, like in autom automotive application. If you put at one meter the antenna from the device under test, you can pick up from, the, um, from a small area of your product, for example, from a display or from a small PCB, you can pick up a signal that theoretically you will not be able to radiate to the far field. Anyway, in my product, I know or I am going to consider that the most important element radiating is this cable. Eh? Look at this, the cable is uh, horizontal and it's not vertical. If the cable is vertical, we'll be radiating vertical electric fields. If the cable is horizontal, we'll be radiating uh, horizontal electric fields. So. Uh, now that I know, or I consider that the noise is being radiated by the cable, I have two possibilities. Is differential mode or is common mode current? Usually in cables, the origin is common mode. Why? Because usually you put the uh, red and the black wire one close to the other. So the current that is going through the red wire and is creating a magnetic field here is canceled by the current that is going in the red, in the black wire, in the opposite direction, creating a magnetic field that is opposite in the antenna. So in theory, the uh, magnetic field or the electric fields that are created by this cable are canceled at some distance. This is what we call the cancellation effect. And this is what we try to do when uh, uh, designing a circuit, we consider to avoid a uh, loops, you know? So the idea is that I am injecting some kind of common mode current. This common mode current to fail at three meters or these typical distances must be not very big. You inject more than 10, 15 microamps of current in this cable, you can fail at three meters. So one of the things you will be able to do is to measure the current in the cable in common mode. And this is because we usually work with current probes. So this is the current probe I will be using in my experiment, this one, okay? It's a current probe with a bandwidth of 50 hertz to 200, 400 megahertz, depending on the model. And from the manufacturer, you will be able to have how is the transducer factor of this device, because you are measuring current, but you are obtaining in the output a voltage. And this conversion is frequency related, no? So if we switch again to the uh, setup, what I do is to open, this is very important for a current probe, is the possibility to open it. And I put the current probe in the cable, no? Obviously, uh, something that must be done in real applications is to fix in place the cable. Typically with this kind of tape is very useful. And additionally, remember to avoid movements of the current probe in the cable once you are measuring one time, no? At, at, if the cable is long and the frequency is high, usually in some specific position of the cable, you can identify that you have nulls and some specific position you have maximums. You have a standing wave 
in the cable, no? So it's important to identify the position that is good for you and to avoid movements. I'm going to put the probe here. Why? Because in my next experiment, I will try to put a ferrite here. If I put the current probe here and save the result, and then to introduce the ferrite, I move the current probe, perhaps the result of the new measurement is the view to the ferrite and the new position of the current probe. So let's put the current probe here and let's connect the current probe in channel number two. Let me take the cable, coax cable, and connect the cable to channel number two. This is not very, very nice, but I hope you understand the general idea. Okay, let me show you the screen of the oscilloscope. Okay, and here uh, on instrument transition. Okay, so we, what you see here is the, the previous measurement, is the antenna measurement. So let me activate channel number two, it's in green color. And we put here channel number two. This is the activity we have in the cable. It's uh, uh, very similar to the activity I am detecting in the antenna. And now I can uh, plot the FFT. So I go to the FFT. We start in 80 megahertz, same frequency range, to 300 megahertz with a resolution bandwidth of 10 kilohertz for the green trace. And we put here the FFT. Uh, let me uh, put the, uh, the intensity of the signal higher so all the people can see easily. So you see that obviously the, the waveform, the, the, the shape of the mountain is not uh, exactly equal because the, the, the re frequency response of the antenna, of the probe, blah, 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 is different. But you can see that if you have a strong energy at some specific frequencies in the antenna and the cable is the origin of this emission, you will see a mountain around this area. Okay, so this is electric field, this is current. So the, if you want to reduce 20 dB this electric field, what you can do is to try to reduce 20 dB this, uh, this current, okay? So a typical solution for this is to introduce ferrite. okay? What I am going to do is to introduce ferrite in series. So let's go here to introduce this ferrite. Oh, no, sorry, it's not here. Let me go here, as here, okay? So this is the ferrite I will be using, this one, okay? So you go to a ferrite, and then you try to find the ferrite that in the frequency range of your interest, 100, 200 megahertz, I have some specific impedance. If you find that the impedance is basically in the area where the impedance is maximum, this area is typically related with a resistive effect for the ferrite. That means you will be introducing resistive effect, 800, 700, 600 ohms, and the noise will be dissipated. The noise is like disappear, no? If you go to the lower part of the response of the, I, I, I'm not sure in this ferrite how is this, but this is the typical resistive effect and the inductive effect can take some a response something like this, no? So the ferrite is offering inductive and resistive effect, and the total impedance is something like this. This is the total impedance that is created by a resistive and a reactive effect. What we are looking for when using a ferrite is the resistive effect. And as you can see in this data sheet, I am interested in two terms, no? So if we go to the camera again, here, okay, here, what I am going to do, or perhaps perhaps the top view is better to see this. Okay, this top view. Okay, so let's take the ferrite. Uh, before that, before that, let me show you in the camera, in the screen of the oscilloscope, using the reference, I can create or I can save the result of the injected current in the cable update here. And we see in white color is our actual measurement to have a reference. And now let me introduce, oh, let me see why, oh wow, the mouse is 
go in slow <laughs> now okay so let me introduce the ferrite let's see here it's important to try not to move the current probe okay so we put two turns like this something like this sorry something like this oops and let me show you how is the current probe no so oops sorry Oh, okay, now, here, okay. You can see that with two turns in the ferrite, I am introducing here, I don't remember exactly from the data sheet, 800 ohms, and the 800 ohms try to limit the common mode current that is going in this direction. It's important not to move the current probe. So the current probe must be exactly in the same position where you measure the reference signal. No? If we switch to the screen of the oscilloscope again, you can see the difference. So here, if you consider that I have 10 dBs per division, I can consider that in this frequency range of around 110, 120, 130 megahertz, I am reducing 15, 20, 10, 15 dBs emissions. This is a typical result from ferrite. Ferrite is not usually able to reduce 40, 50 dBs your emissions. No? And additionally, the effect of ferrite is relative to the terminal impedances, impedances that usually are unknown. Okay? So you can start to consider to filter or to shield the probes. No? Another important tool for debugging is the near field probe. Let me show you the near field probe. Okay, so we go here, and near field probes can be electric near field probes or magnetic near field probes. Electric near field probes are useful for measuring electric fields, and they are very useful when you are interested in DVDT. Magnetic near field probes are loops, and they are very useful when you are trying to identify where you have DIDT, magnetic fields. No, they can be big loops or small loops, big tips or small tips. The idea is that if the loop or if the tip is big, you will have more sensibility and lower bandwidth. But sorry, if, is, if, the, if the probe is big, you have less bandwidth and you will be more sensitive, but you will not be uh, good in a spatial resolution. If you reduce the size of the loop or the size of the tip, you will have the possibility to identify exactly at the pin level or the trace level, where is the origin of the signal, and uh, with a higher bandwidth, okay? But the probe will be less sensitive. So this, this is what we will try to do now. Let me show you the screen of the oscilloscope, and now the picture, no? So if we try to do this with a near field probe, let me take this near field probe here. It's a medium-sized loop, okay? that I will be connected to channel number three, okay? So let's go to the screen of the oscilloscope here. Oops. And let me activate channel number three. Channel number three is in orange color. You can put channel number three here. Look at this, I am using three channels at the same time in time domain and in frequency domain. Let me plot the FFT from 80 megahertz to 300 megahertz with a resolution bandwidth of 10 kilohertz. Oops, sorry, 10 kilohertz at the orange color. And then we put the FFT in the lower part of the screen, okay? So you can see that I have yellow color is the antenna, time frequency domain, green color is the uh, current probe, uh, time frequency domain, and orange color is the result of the near field probe. If we try to see how is the um, measurement with the probe, we can go here and we can go around the system. No, uh, If I go close to the cable, this is what, what I am going to do. Okay, if I go close to the cable, I will identify the peak. Eh? This is what I am going to do 
uh, in the uh, next uh, view of the oscilloscope screen. No, let me switch to the oscilloscope screen and look at the orange color. I am far from the cable. I am close to the cable, so I can I am able to identify where I have energy. I can test around what cables I have a specific activity. Or, for example, I can go around the slots. No, I am going to do this in the next view of the oscilloscope screen, okay? So here you can see, look at the orange color. You can see that the energy is being go, is going out of the slots. This is dangerous for emissions? No, because these slots are not able to radiate to the far field. But if you see here, I put a small cable uh, that is inside of the PCB close to the slots. So the energy is in this area and the energy is able to be coupled to external cables, no? So for example, you have some kind of external cable that is close to the system in this position. The energy can be coupled to the cable and the cable can be a good antenna to re-radiate the signal. No? So what is inside of this product? Usually what we try is to solve the problem at the circuit level, no? It's exactly the same circuit I was uh, working with in my first webinar. So. Let me show you here, and you see, let me show you the PCB. I have a PCB that is powered with this cable. Okay? It's uh, 20 volts, more or less, and the output 12 volts is powering this fan. And this cable, the load cable of the DC-DC converter, is the cable that is going close to the slots in the cover of the enclosure. Okay. And the, the energy that is here is being coupled to the slots. No? So where is the origin of the signals I am radiating inside of the DC-DC converter? What I can do is to change to a smaller loop, something like this, and then I can go around the circuit. I am going to do this in the next uh, view of the oscilloscope screen. And especially I will finish around the inductor in the DC-DC converter. No? So we go to the screen of the oscilloscope and let's go around the PCB and this is what I see when I get very close to the inductor in the DC-DC converter. So you can identify exactly where you have more energy. So something that you will do probably is to try to identify uh, who is creating this energy. Remember, this is not harmonics of your signal. I am not switching at 100 megahertz. They are not harmonics of my 500 kilohertz switching frequency in the DC-DC converter. Perhaps it's an oscillation, perhaps it's a ringing or resonance, no? So let's go to the screen uh, with the camera and let me use this similar PCB. It's exactly the same PCB. And I am going to empower the other one. Let me go here to introduce the power to this device. And let me take the fan outside of the box to connect here. Okay, so now the system is working. Let me show you the screen of the oscilloscope. You see that this basically is very similar. It's not exactly the same because the two PCBs, they are not exactly equal, but you can see that they have the mountains in the same frequencies. And let me see what happened when I go close to this area, I see the energy. So something that I will do is to check how the circuit is switching. So to see how the circuit is switching, I will connect. I will do the preset of the oscilloscope and I will connect to channel number one, a passive probe, okay? Something like this, okay? And obviously to see how the circuit is switching, I cannot use the pigtail of the probe, okay? So I am going to connect in this in this way, okay? So I have prepared my PCB. That is because I have changed the PC board. I have introduced it here, uh, um, uh, the pin to the drain uh, that is switching. And here I have the connection to ground, okay? So let me show you the screen of my oscilloscope. But first consider that my oscilloscope could be, for example, a 20 megahertz oscilloscope. What happened if your oscilloscope is a 20 megahertz oscilloscope? Okay, this is the signal of the switching activity. You see this, 
Okay, it's, it's in this way. And we adjust the trigger. So this is a typical uh, switching uh, signal in a DC-DC converter, okay? So my oscilloscope is now with a bandwidth of 20 megahertz. What happens if instead of limiting to 20 megahertz the bandwidth of the oscilloscope, I increase to full bandwidth. My oscilloscope is two gigahertz in bandwidth. Not necessary for this application two gigahertz, but this is what I'm going to do. I open the menu and in the bandwidth, go here to uh, activate full uh, waste bandwidth from uh, 20 megahertz. Let me put full. And this is the difference of a high bandwidth instrument or a low bandwidth instrument. Okay. Obviously, if we open the switching activity, here is the difference. Here is the difference. This frequency, this ringing, is what is creating the uh, anomalous emissions. So how can I uh, remove this ringing? You have different possibilities. This is very related with the layout of the PCB. Francesc Strages was explaining in the first uh, presentation how to do a good layout for minimizing this kind of effects. Or perhaps in some specific application, you can try to uh, kill the ringing. Usually well, the ringings can be killed with snubbers, with resistors, or with ferrites, depending on your application. No? So this is what I'm going to do in my demo. Again, if we go to the screen with the camera, let me disconnect again the, um, the new PC board I was using. Let me work again inside of the box this way. And let me power again here, externally, this way, OK? Now I have again the same product like before. Okay. Let me remove the board where I was measuring the ringing. Uh, perhaps we can try to identify how is the ringing here. Now, let me go here to remove the fright. So we create a very anomalous situation. And let me close the product. Okay. And now, we will repeat the measurement, no? Now, let me go to the screen of the oscilloscope. Let me see what happened with the antenna. Connecting the antenna to channel number one, okay? What I see in channel number one, let me activate FFT from 80 megahertz, 80 megahertz, 80 megahertz to 300 megahertz. Oh, sorry to 300 megahertz, stop frequency, 300 megahertz, and resolution bandwidth, 10 kilohertz. Okay, this is the, the, my, my first measurement, no? This is the antenna. Let me activate channel number two to see the output from the uh, current probe in the cable, measuring common mode current. Activate FFT from 80 megahertz to 300 megahertz, okay, with a resolution bandwidth of 10 kilohertz in channel number two. It's the same like before, okay? So I have the mountain, no? Let me open the box. I'm going to open the box. And what I am going to do now is to go inside of the PCB and I'm going to remove this jumper. What is this jumper? Later we can talk about this, but this jumper is trying to introduce a small ferry bit in the switching activity of my DC-DC converter. So if we go to the screen of the oscilloscope, we go to reference and we activate for math number two, the reference one here. Let me put here in the middle like a reference. And let's go to the screen to remove this jump. Okay, and this is the result. You see? I have removed it completely, the emissions, the broadband emissions, because the ferrite is killing. This is not a magical solution. You have another risk with the ferrite bit, eh? but this is to demonstrate that with something that in theory is very cheap, is introducing a small ferrite bit. But the jumper can go in and out to source circuit the ferrite. This jumper is source circuit in the ferrite. So it's very, very nice to see how if I introduce again the jumper to a source circuit the ferrite, so the ferrite is not working, you can see the jumper is now on top of the two pins. 
Now, if I introduce the jumper more and more, the parasitic inductance that is around this ferrite is, uh, is changing. So now look at where is the peak in the green color trace is. And when I am introducing, you see that the peak is going to the right. This is because the inductive effect of the jumper is very important. They are, I don't know, five, six, 10 nano Henry's. But with these five, six, 10 nano Henry's, I, am, I have the possibility to do some kind of tuning of the LC parasitic effect. And finally, let me disconnect this and see what happened if I use a good layout. What I am going to use is the same PC board. I will not describe the design techniques today because it's in the first day webinar and I hope you have the recording. Okay, this is the board that I was using from MPS. This is a board with four layers and trying to uh, work with a specific good layout Many of the techniques included here were explained by Franz, uh, by Francesc uh, a few uh, hours ago, no, two hours ago. So let me power the board and let me see how are the emissions, okay? For the people that was not attending the first webinar, this is a DC-DC converter, okay? It's a back converter down, uh, that is powered in the same voltage. I am going to power it with 20 volts, okay? And I have here a resistive load to make the circuit switching uh, at maximum load. Let me switch off the lights and let me switch on the lights in the camera. So perhaps it's better. Okay. And now let me show you how are the emissions when I switch on the device. Let me go to the screen of my oscilloscope here. Let me remove the reference one because it's, it was from the previous uh, experiment and let me remove the green color that is the result of the current probe that I am not using now. No, so now what you see here is basically the antenna. The device under test is off. Remember, the device under test is this. Let me go. I am close to finish. Okay, so here I have 20 volts. This is the DC DC converter. I have three volts here that are um, powering this, this uh, power uh, resistor, okay? So the, because the device under test is off, this is the result of emissions. Let me save in memory, update. Okay, so let me see, math one, update. So this is my reference of my emissions. Let me see what happened when I, when I switch on my device. Really, you need to believe me. Now the switch is, the, the device is on. You see, there is no difference, no emissions. The product is not inside the box, a box. The, the product is using a big cable, but all the noise is contained inside of the two layers of the PC board. And if you don't believe that the DC-DC converter is working, what we can do is to go to the full view of the camera back here. And I am going to use the Nifty Pro. Okay, again, connected to channel number three. So you, we can activate channel number three. We see here channel number three in orange color. Let me show you the screen of the oscilloscope. Okay, this is the time domain, top left, time domain, uh, bottom left, frequency domain of the antenna. Uh, uh, bottom right is the uh, save the the FFT of the antenna that was safe in memory. And top right is the output of the NIFRI probe. And you can see that when I go close to the inductor in the DC-DC converter, you can see that the, I have the noise that is created by the DC-DC converter. So the DC-DC conver DC -DC converter is working, but emissions are very, very low, almost difficult to measure in this application. So I hope you enjoy this, uh, it really is it's difficult to, to work with all these topics in only 50, 40 minutes. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the presentation and I will be happy to answer any questions you have uh, about this presentation or any topic in, in EMI EMC. Thank you very much, Arturo. Uh, I see we already have a couple questions in there, but just to let everyone know, you know, if you mouse over your Zoom 
webinar interface, you'll see a Q&A button and you can type questions in there. And okay. once again, a reminder that uh, all these sessions are recorded. They, are, they will be available um, on demand within the next couple of days and we will be sending you an email about where to find them. Mm -hmm. All right, the first one was, how do we determine the maximum radiation for orientating the antenna? Conversely, what if the radiation is neither horizontal nor vertical, but rather at an angle relative to the horizon? Yes, uh, it's a good question because uh, electric field perhaps is not vertical or fully vertical or fully horizontal, but considering that in many uh, official regulations you need to measure in both uh, orientation, that is because I am working with vertical and horizontal. Obviously, if you have a, a electric field that is not uh, specifically vertical or horizontal in other position of the antenna, uh, you will have uh, higher emissions. No, But regulations are measuring in horizontal and vertical only. So that is because I was doing that. Next up, what would be some steps that can be taken to hide radiated emissions into a diagonal plane. Is this even something that's possible? To hide radiated emissions into a diagonal plane. Sorry, but I don't understand the questions. Sorry. I All don't right. understand the question. Sorry. Sorry. If you want to try and clarify, we'll we'll try and swing back to this one again. Yes, um, of course. After, after the if next not, few, I, it. if not, I can answer by email. If not possible, in time. Okay. Great. Thanks. Uh, where is the ferrite connected in the circuit? The ferrite reduces the noise. Ah, good, good question. Uh, let me uh, let me switch to the slides. This is a slide. Uh, this is the slide I was using in my previous uh, webinar. It's the same DC-DC converter. And you know that the switching node with the high DVDT activity is here. This is a switching node where we have a strong DVDT of the transistor switching. So what happened? Here you have inductance. We have inductance here. We have inductance distributed through the layout. It's the layout of my PC board is not like the layout of, from MPS with ground, good ground planes, it's a two-layer board, and I have some kind of nano Henrys in this uh, layout, no? And I have parasitic capacitance, parasitic capacitance related with the transistor, to the ground, to the in the diode, blah, blah, blah. So the position for my ferrite is exactly here. What I am trying to introduce is a ferrite here that can create some problems in the DC-DC converter, but uh, if you select correctly and you check the behavior of the converter, we, you will not have problems, no? Anyway, my idea was to demonstrate that if you have a ringing, something like an inductance and a capacitance that are ringing, no? If you exit, excite with a square wave signal, L and C, and you don't have losses, the output will be doing something like this. This is what we call underdamp situation, no? If you introduce a resistive effect in some position in this LC circuit, what you do is to dump the resonant, no? It's the same idea with uh, snubbers, no? But in the demo, I am introducing the ferrite here, no? So the jumper I was talking about, the jumper is a jumper that is exactly here. This is one pin, this is another pin, and the jumper is here. So when the jumper is in position, it's short circuiting the ferrite, top to bottom. And when you have seen that the mountain was moving left to right, right to left, when I introduce and move the jumper, the idea is that here in these pins, I have some kind of parasitic inductance, no? So reducing the, uh, introducing more and more and more the uh, jumper in position, the inductive effect for the switching node is reduced, and then the uh, peak of the frequency go up in frequency. If you put the jumper here, the inductive effect for the switching node increase, and because the inductance is higher, the peak of the resonance goes down. That is the idea. Great, thank you. This one is why are all the why do all the evaluation boards have input and output ports on the opposite sides of the PCB? 
and not both connectors at one side or edge of the PCB. Well, I suppose that the evaluation boards are created to, to demonstrate the behavior of the integrated circuit. If you are considering EMI, you have two possibilities. No, What I usually like is to put the input and the output in opposite sides. No, This is the idea. This is the input cable, and this is the output cable. With this configuration, you do what? You have the best uh, situation to avoid coupling, to avoid coupling between the input and the output. If you put the output connector close to the input, you have more probabilities to have coupling between the input and the output, and for example, to have problems with immunity or emissions, depending on your setup. No, So advantage to put the connectors in opposite sides is to avoid coupling between the input and the output. And probably this is because many evaluation boards are done in this way. But be careful because in some situations, if you put the input connector here and the output connector here, and this is the cable, eh, what you are, what you can be creating, this is dependent of how you do the layout of the PCB, what you are creating here is the possibility to excite of this voltage a dipole, okay? So if you, if you create a dipole, you will have a current that is doing this, zoop, 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 from left to right, from right to left, and at the frequencies where this is lambda over four, and this is lambda over four, you are creating something close to a parasitic dipole. If you put this cable in the same area, it's like if you have one antenna, like the, remember the antenna I was, was using in my in my demo. You have a good antenna. This uh, arm and this arm must be one separated from the other. If you put the arms one close to the other, this will not radiate. Okay. Uh, so with connectors with, with cables that are one close to the other, you minimize the possibility to have parasitic dipoles. But you have advantages and disadvantages. Next up, aren't there impacts on the disturbances due to the fan? The fan can have effect in two th parts. The first one is that the cable that is powering the fan is not filtered. And the second one is that the fan is, uh, is the load of the, of the DC-DC converter and can uh, do uh, the DC-DC converter working in some specific way or, or another. No. So see, yes, the load of the DC-DC converter can have effect in the emissions from the DC-DC converter. Okay, what is the reasoning behind having one turn or more turns for ferrite? What, what defines that? Yes, if you have a ferrite like this one uh, and you introduce the wire through the ferrite, this is one turn, you can observe that the impedance you get is something like this, for example. So uh, I have, I don't know, at this frequency, I have uh, 600 ohms. If you uh, take the cable and instead of introducing one time, you make one time through the ferrite and another second turn, the idea is that you are, is like if you are introducing two times the impedance. So the, what you will be expecting is that the impedance you are offering is higher. But the effect in the real ferrite is that usually you increase the impedance, not to the double value, the, you increase the impedance, but the, pickle, the peak is decreased. So be careful about this, no? Because if you are working at this frequency, for example, the, going to two turns can be interesting, no? This is two turns, this is one turn. Can be interesting because you are increasing the impedance in series for the common mode. But if you increase to two turns and you have the EMI frequency here, look at this, because you are reducing the peak, perhaps the impedance is decreasing. So you think that you are going to increase impedance, but really you are decreasing the impedance. This is because like with inductors, you have parasitic capacitance between the turns and the component is bigger and these parasitic effects reduce the, the bandwidth. Great, thank you. Uh, next one is, where was the tuning jumper located in parallel yes. with the power supply to the big decoupling cap? No, it was here. It's, this is what I explained it. it probably uh, uh, the, the question was uh, sent uh, before 
I was explaining, you know, the jumper is here, it's short circuiting a ferrite that is in the output of the DC DC converter to demonstrate that the ferrite can uh, kill a resonance. No, I insist that be careful about this technique. And additionally, with this ferrite, we are introducing inductive effect. The inductive effect at low frequencies can create increase in emissions in conducted emissions. No, if you have the 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 converter switching in this way. No, you are the converter switching in this way. Perhaps later you will switch in this way. The frequency is lower because you are introducing more inductance, and you can identify an increase in emissions in conducted emission below below thirty megahertz. Okay. All right, and I think you've already covered this one. Where was the ferrite placed in the circuit? You've got that right okay. there. Uh, let's see. How do you manage to contain the, the SN oscillation within the PCB and not be coupled into the VN, GND, or the V out? Oh, I suppose that this, this question is related with the MPS evaluation board, no? Uh, if you look at the evaluation board information, you will see that they are using four layers with a good layout of the ground planes. And additionally, you, they have a good decoupling capacitors, high frequency capacitors for filtering the activity. And additionally, they have introduced filters in the output uh, cable. So. Uh, this is the way to, this is the secret of EMI. EMI is the technique to control or to contain electromagnetic energy where you want, you know, avoiding to arrive cables or, or other elements that can be good antennas. So my recommendation is to check the evaluation board uh, information. I think it's in the, in the, you will see in the slides that you will receive, you have the reference and if you want uh, this one. Okay, this is the the evaluation board that I was testing this one. So you have this information in the web, MPS website. Thank you. This one is, I have some radiation I discovered from decoupling capacitors with loop with loop antenna. Do you know do you know what that could be? I have some radiation. I discovered from decoupling capacitors with loop antenna. Do you know? Oh, I don't know if if with loop antenna he wants to talk about uh, uh, some kind of um, uh, near field probe or something like that because from the coupling capacitor is difficult to identify. If you look at one of the uh, pictures, uh, one of the, the slides of Francesc, he was explaining that you have here the integrated circuit. And this is the VA, V in node. If you put a capacitor for decoupling, this is my capacitor, uh, SMD capacitor, and this net is connected to ground. So the, the, the idea is that the integrated circuit is requesting current, switching currents, no? So if you put a capacitor, the capacitor is extracting the current through the, uh, through the, the from the ground to the, uh, through the capacitor to the device under test, and then, then it's returning to the capacitor, no? So you have here a small loop. That is because Francesc was explaining that the technique to reduce the emissions from this capacitor is to put a capacitor that is symmetrical, no? Because then the current goes in opposite direction. And then you have two loops. This loop, you have this loop with currents in different directions. So the magnetic field at this point is minimized, no? Because one of the loops cancel the magnetic field created by the other. So I suppose that you are with the near-field probes identifying that around your uh, decoupling capacitors or capacitor or capacitor that are in parallel, uh, you have this uh, high frequency currents. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see, the diagonal plane will have cosine and sine components of the horizontal and vertical antenna fields. The diagonal plane will have cosine. Uh, yes, correct. Uh, th this is related with the previous question, perhaps. Uh, you know, I just missed these uh, okay. through uh, here uh, and I can't yes, see them. Uh, 
the diagonal plane uh, from this uh, comment is the idea that if your device under test is here and is radiating, here you have the antenna measuring some polarization. So if the electric field, if the electric field is uh, vertical, you can plot electric fields in this way. Magnetic field will be horizontal, okay? And it's going in this direction, it, this direction, okay? So this is the plane. This is the diagonal plane is where the electric and the magnetic field are contained. And the product of the electric and the magnetic field is what we call the pointing vector. This is in the far field, so this is the idea, but I don't remember how to apply this to the previous question, sorry. I forgot you. Uh, well, let, let me, I think I, he, he typed in some more. So let me try and read this all together and see if this makes any more sense. Sorry about that. Uh, so we start with diagonal plane will have cosine and sine components of the horizontal and vertical antenna fields. Therefore, the emission can't be hidden in the diagonal plane. I think that was the full of it. Mm. Yes, probably is referring that in the in the diagonal plane you don't have emission because you are receiving the plane wave uh, orthogonal to the diagonal plane is the pointing vector. Okay, great. And then this one just says in low frequency one point megahertz, and it's not switching frequency. I'm not sure what they're addressing it. It was while you were still giving the presentation. It looks like though. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's just, uh, do you generally recommend an RC snubber between uh, the yes. SW node and the GND? Uh, it's not mandatory. It depends on the layout you have, the size of the package of your components. And if at the end you cannot minimize the nano Henry's and the pico farads of the resonances, you will need an, uh, some kind of uh, a snubber to to avoid the, the peaks. So uh, I recommend to, mi to, to minimize the possibility to have ringing with a good layout and components placement. And if this is not possible, pues you will need the, the rest RC snubber. RC snubber sometimes is, is impossible to avoid in, in, in flybacks, in the diode, in the output of the uh, flybacks uh, secondary, in, in the secondary of the flyback or in, in other switching activities. So. It's not really that I recommend. It's that in some application is mandatory, you know. But with good layout in the in the PC board I have uh, presented from MPS, I remember that there is no RCS number and the emissions are minimal. Okay, thank you. I can just let's see. Uh, this is can be the formula to find. How is the uh, field at some distance in the yes, yes, probably. I don't remember exactly the formula, but probably yes, I suppose. Well, if you are you seeing his formula in this one, it's actually coming across three different questions, Arturo, if you see it all. Yeah, this is the, the formula related with the area of a loop that has uh, with uh, area A, where you have a current I at some frequency F2. And you want to see to to calculate how is the field at some distance d. So yes, these kind of formulas are useful to estimate how will be the current, the electric or the magnetic field at some distance. Yes. Great. Some thank yous to you. Let's see. Uh... Can you use a circular antenna and receive all the polarities uh, but you will not be able to identify if the polarization is vertical or horizontal this is very useful you if you are able to identify if the orientation is vertical if the polarization is vertical or horizontal this is a very good clue to identify if the emissions are coming from horizontal cables vertical cables horizontal slots or vertical slots so you have another kind of antenna that uh, with the possibility to to identify different uh, polarizations you will see the signal but you will not be able to make debugging in the same way great thank you 
Uh, this is going back to an earlier one, if we can keep them all straight. To clarify the earlier question, if I have good results in the horizontal antenna orientation, but bad results in the vertical orientation for radiated emissions, what would be the steps to move in between? Ah, okay, okay. Uh, well, this is very difficult to, to answer, but let me consider that your product is a box like this one and you have a cable, power, data, or something like that. And like you say here, you are failing in vertical or in, or in polarization, not in horizontal, no? So if this is the table, and considering that you are failing at frequency from 30 megahertz to 400 megahertz, let's say something like this, my impression would be that you are failing because you have cables. I am considering that your device is not something like, like a big rack, no? I am considering the, the size of the product not very, very big, no? So if you have, for example, uh, some kind of uh, horizontal cable to some accessory, this is the horizontal cable, and this is the vertical cable. If you are failing in this frequency range, 30 to 400 megahertz, and you are failing in vertical polarization, in my opinion, the culprit could be the vertical cables, okay? If you increase the frequency, if you go from 300 megahertz to, I don't know, one gigahertz or something like that, you need to look for a smaller systems. Obviously the cables can contribute in the same way, but we will look additionally for a smaller elements that usually are uh, slots or apertures if your enclosure is metallic, no? So for horizontal, polar, for vertical polarization, you will look for horizontal slots or, and for uh, horizontal polarization, you will look for vertical slots, okay? It's the opposite, no? An horizontal slot create a vertical electric field and a vertical uh, slot create an horizontal electric field, no? If you work with the uh, near field probes, you will be able to identify what kind of uh, part of your system is the good antenna. And this is a, one important thing is to identify where is the antenna. So you are able to try to minimize his effect. No? If the case is plastic, probably uh, you can radiate at higher frequencies with the PCB if, if you don't have a good layout. No? Many, many possibilities. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, how can we estimate what frequencies measured by the near field probe will radiate? Calculate the cable and slots dimension with sorry, respect sorry. to the see, frequency. Where is the question? Can you see? Where is the question? See. Are you seeing it okay? I don't see the question. How, how can it, we estimate? No, it, what frequency is it? How, how can we estimate what frequencies measured by the near field probe will radiate? And then it has a follow-up of calculate the cable yeah. and slot dimensions with respect to the frequency. Uh, if you consider that you are in the far field, a typical rule of thumb, but this is a complex idea, is that you you know radiation, no radiation, if size is very small compared with lambda. So you you take your frequency and lambda is 300 over the frequency in megahertz with lambda in meters, no? So a typical rule of thumb to calculate, uh, to, uh, to avoid emissions is that the size must be smaller than lambda over 20. This is what we, in commercial application, we can consider that this is small. Lambda over 10, lambda over 20, depending on the system, no? If you go to some specific application like military or things like that, you can go to lambda over 100. Lambda over 100 is a more safety uh, rule, but the problem is lambda, lambda over 100 is usually more difficult to implement or perhaps more expensive, no? Depending of the of the, where you apply this rule, if in shielding, in cables, or in PCBs. But the idea is to compare the lambda or with the uh, frequency where you fail. That is because here, if you see when I was saying that you fail between 30 megahertz, 30 megahertz is 10 meters. And 400 megahertz, let me write 300, 300 megahertz is one meter. So what systems, what parts of your product are usually good antennas between 30 megahertz and 300 megahertz? Systems that are not very small compared with one meter and 10 meters. That means cables, for example. 
Okay. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, is this essential to have the antenna factor considered during measurements with the oscilloscope? No, no. It's a good information, but usually when we are doing the bugging, we look for qualitative differences. No, we are not specifically interested in some uh, value of voltage or current or something like that. Obviously, you want, you want to identify how much is the current that you are injecting in the cable in common mode. You need to have the factor for the current probe so you can convert volts to uh, to to current to um, to microamps or something like that. In the antenna, it's the same. You want to identify how many dB microvolts, but in the bagging in your laboratory without a sealed chamber or with some limitations, you, what you want to see is what happens if you change the software, you add a spread spectrum, and you put a ferrite, or you move some specific part of the system to see if you reduce 3 dBs, 10 dBs, or 40 dBs. So. Great, thank you. Um, this is a, are, are all the oscilloscope measurements done here near field ones? Uh, in my demo. Uh, probably yes, yes. I am not working in the full far field because I am working at, uh, you have seen, I am working at 100 megahertz. 100 megahertz means that the lambda is three meters. So to be in the far field, I need to be uh, uh, three meters divided by six, no? So I need to be at least 350 centimeters uh, uh, far from uh, the distance, uh, more than 50 centimeters of distance between the antenna and the product. So no, I am not doing a good uh, far field measurement, but this is the way to do this on top of a table, uh, blah, blah, blah. Great, thank you. Um, and again, I'm not sure about going back to diagonal versus horizontal, but it's this, so he says, uh, diagonal plane is not requested by EMI yeah, standards. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I think no. Okay. Uh, why does your circuit not have a earth connection and why capacitors to reduce the EMI? Well, hard connection is a question related with safety. So if your the voltage you are working with is not unsafe, I was working with 20 volts, there is no need for hard connection for protect, user protection for electrocution, no? So I, I have not white capacitors in these applications. The white capacitors are used normally for conducted emissions up to 30 megahertz. What I have not uh, shown in the, in the demo, we don't have time, is the idea that another possibility for, for filtering is instead of using a ferrite in series, is to use a free through capacitor. No? Let me show you here. If I show you the camera, here I have two free through capacitors. This is something like, it's not the same, something like the idea of a capacitor from line to hertz and uh, neutral to hertz. No? In this case, from positive to chassis, and from negative to chassis. So with some kind of cable, I can power my board from here eh, instead of going through the enclosure. And then I have two capacitors in some pico farads and uh, they are connected at 660 degrees to the metal enclosure. This is a very, very nice uh, way to filter high frequencies, hundreds of megahertz, no? I did not... Uh, have time to, to do this demo, but the effect is very similar to the ferrite effect. So very similar. Okay, thank you. Uh, is a switching low side MOSFET of a boost converter where there's a shunt resistor to measure overcurrent from source and GND, where should the RC snubber be connected? From switching node drain to GND or between the drain and a source? In my opinion, it's from from the drain to the to the source, but I cannot uh, answer this question totally sure about that. No. 
Okay. Uh, does a regular light bulb generate high EMC? Uh, if, if with regular light bulbs, you mean a resistive effect, like old bulbs, the answer is no. It's like with a resistor. The problem with lights today is when you are working with LEDs that they are using switching power electronics. No. Thanks. Uh, and then how to reduce radiation from cables if the cable length cannot be reduced? Oh, good, good question. But the, this is, is not, is not very uh, difficult to answer. I think, look at this, this is your product. And this is the cable that is radiating. Obviously you can, one possibility is if you reduce the length, you will radiate less or you will need energy in higher frequencies to be able to radiate. So in this application, I cannot reduce the length of the uh, cables. The first things you must consider is that both wires or the end wires of the cable must be very, very close one to the other. In this way, differential mode currents will not be able to radiate. If you do something like this, you take your red wire and the red wire is separated from the black wire in some millimeters or some millimeter, you will radiate in differential mode. So the first idea is to put one exactly uh, one close to the other. The second idea, the cable is something that is uh, passive. So if you are radiating, it's because you are exciting with noise. So the second important idea is to kill the source. For example, if this is a ringing, you kill the ringing and you will not be able to excite this cable independently of the uh, energy of the frequency or the length of the cable. And another solution is if you introduce for this signal some kind of filter, no? ferrites, capacitors, inductors, depending on the application, the frequency, blah, blah, blah. No? Uh, so the, uh, the first, let me write here, the first solution is a small loop. The second solution is kill the source. The third solution is filter. And the fourth solution, perhaps this is the last option, is sealing, no? But sealing with a good technique, no? Sometimes people add sealing in cables and at the end is the uh, a screen of the sealed cable who is radiating. So it's very, very important to uh, do a very good connection uh, in the of the seal to the chassis, no? So I think that these uh, four solutions are the most important things you can do. Great. Uh, let's see, if one ferrite clipped on the cable is not enough, can I use two or three? Yes, you can use two or three in series and you will be introducing more and more impedance, but probably the customer will say no. <laughs> Probably this is not permitted in many applications, but uh, technically it's possible. Okay, and then I think back back to your drawing that you're on there. Uh, there, there was ha, just a how do you kill the source? Ah, the key, to kill the source is the what I was explaining, no? Uh, in the in my demo, one possibility to kill the source is you have a circuit where you have a ringing. And if you, if you look at the signal without the ringing, oh, no, in this way. So what happened? You are creating, uh, I don't know, this kind of emissions, this mountain, okay? This is related with this frequency, okay? So if I add a snubber or ferrite like in the demo, I convert my signal in something like this, and then the emissions or the profile of emissions goes down. So why is this kill the source? I am killing the source because the energy that was created and radiated is not necessary in my circuit and I uh, make it disappear, no? You have another possibilities for, I don't know, for example, you have a circuit and it's not very good decoupled. You can introduce a good decoupling circuit depending of the, of the application uh, to, to minimize the possibility to have high frequency current in the power 
lines, no? High frequency not permitted in the BCC or the ground lines, no? Uh, you can you can try to work inside of the circuit to avoid this uh, energy. For example, another possibility, if you are working with this kind of signal, switching very fast, perhaps you can try to switch slower, no? This is a technique to minimize, right? I don't know. It's to minimize the possibility to create emissions. Uh, in one of the uh, speaks uh, from the first day seminar, we saw that if you have a signal that is being switched with a, a fixed frequency, if we apply a spread spectrum, we can uh, remember from the from the Florian uh, talk, the uh, spread spectrum, uh, spread the energy in the spectrum and the peak is reduced, no? This is another technique to kill the source. Like you are not in this last ex um, uh, example killing, but, you are reducing the origin of the problem, the energy of the origin of the problem. Very good, thank you. Uh, and just a heads up, we're gonna cut off any extra questions here at the top of the hour. So I thought yeah. we were just about to get through, but they keep coming. So here we go. We'll, we'll give it another five minutes worth. Um, any advice to reduce bulk current induction for twisted pair, but a 25 meter long, Truck harnesses? I, I've got that uh, right. No, probably the only possibility is to filter, I think. Filtering is what I think. I Thank consider you. that you cannot uh, seal, you know? If not, sealing is another solution. Can, can, can we twist the cables to reduce capaci capacitance? Uh, I'm not sure what capacitance he is explaining, but consider that if you have a red and a black wire and one is close to the other, very, very close one to the other, and you compare the capacitance between the cables when you uh, when you make a twisted pair, something like this, the effect of the twisted pair is that capacitance between the uh, wires increase, is not reduced. But this is not a bad. It, perhaps it's bad or not, depending on your application. No? But twisting, you increase the capacitance between the two wires. Not sure what kind of capacitance you are interested. Thank you. Uh, can you use a standard AC line filter on the power source input? What about to feed through the caps on the connector? Yes, if you, if I am understanding that you refer that your product is powered by DC and you want to use an AC line filter, well, the, the low pass filter response will give the, you the possibility to, to apply a DC voltage. This is what I am doing here in my demo. Okay, I am using a filter. Let me show you with the camera. In my demo, my 20 volts goes to the device under test. So this filter, this is this is an AC filter. So DC is going through, and I am filtering any noise from, I don't know, 150 kilohertz to some megahertz, and that create a quiet power supply for me. No, obviously, I don't know what application you have. And about feed through capacitors is what I have been explaining. In uh, when I was uh, showing the uh, free through capacitors in my box, no, these capacitors that are uh, similar to the Y capacitors, no, from line to chassis, from the other line to chassis. Thank you. All right, I think it's this is the last one, and then we'll send emails out on the couple okay. remaining. Um, why ringing creates a broadband frequency if it oscillates at one frequency? Oh, this is a very good question. This is the idea. You are switching in this way and you have here a frequency that is mm, more or less constant, no? Usually it's more or less constant, no? So the, your first idea is that if the a signal has this spectrum, your idea is that because you have this ringing, you will be increasing the energy at the frequency that is in the same value. But why? we see something like this. Why we see a mountain instead of a peak at the frequency where you have the um, this, uh, this ringing? Uh, 
what you need to consider is what happened if you see a signal that in time domain is doing something like this. This is time domain, no? It's a peak. It is repetitive, no? So what you need to think is the signal is repetitive. Constantly, you have this peak here, no? So it's like you have two signals. One is the square wave signal. The other is the underdamped ringing. But the underdamped ringing is periodic, okay? So if you remember from the school, the direct delta has an FFT that has a flat response with some specific amplitude to the infinite, no? So what we have here really is a ringing, a ringing, a ringing, a ringing. And that is because this energy is not at one frequency. It's a repetitive signal with a very sharp response. But this mountain that you are creating is around, the maximum is not around, it's not exactly F0, but it's close to F0. That is the idea. It's a pulse that is repetitive. All right. Thank you very much, Arturo. I think okay. at, at that point, we're going to have to, to call it good for the day. Uh, for the last couple of questions, we'll send you out answers on those ones. But um, thank you for all your time and all the thorough answers, Arturo. That was a lot of good stuff today. And for everyone that attended and, and attended last week's as well, we very much appreciate uh, you joining with us and, and working through a lot of these different scenarios. Okay, thank you. Have a good day. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.